This conference will now be recorded. All right, welcome everybody. Um, you are at Nightlight Astrology attending the Summer Speaker Series. If you're new, that's where you are. So you have a sense of where in the world you are hanging out tonight. Um, let me tell you a little bit about our speaker series and um, tonight's speaker and uh, lots of kind of um, good information about how you can um, uh, donate to tonight's event and all, all sorts of good stuff. So um, uh, every season of the zodiacal year, I host through my um, the courses that I teach, uh, I host three speakers. And uh, we usually host them in consecutive weeks and try to bring in speakers who teach on things that are very um, you know, unique or different from the things that I'm teaching in my own students. That way they, you know, my students get someone other than me. They don't have to listen to me all the time. I can hear some other professionals from the field and maybe some different topics, things that I'm, usually I try to invite people who teach things or know about things that I know nothing about or that I'm really curious about, or sometimes just people who have such talent and um, abilities that I want to hear how they're teaching a topic, maybe something I already know about, but you know, so unique. Every astrologer brings something unique to the topic. So, uh, so this series is also um, a way for for me to learn new things, and also a way to promote other astrologers in the astrological community. Um, one thing I'm really passionate about is trying to um, promote sort of ecumenical astrological education, um, trying to uh, bring really good astrologers out to more people. So in the astrology world, you know, it's a little bit like the Wild West sometimes where, you know, it's like like solo gunslingers on horses riding around and, and you know, we all individual practitioner based uh, field in some ways. So, you know, you're, you're trying to establish your practice and stuff like that. And I think it's very important for us as astrologers to sort of promote each other's work, take interest in and learn from one another and so forth. So this program is just dedicated also to um, uh, astrological community. So <clears throat> on that note, I'll tell you a little bit about the summer speaker series that we've been hosting the past few weeks. Um, on July 24th, Kelly Surtees was here giving a talk on special signatures in the birth chart. That was a fantastic, um, uh, wonderful talk. And then uh, last week on Tuesday, July 31st, uh, Gemini Brett was here giving a talk called Reflections on Soul, Mysteries of the Moon. That was also very exciting, interesting um, talk. Uh, both of the audio videos for those talks are available still. If you'd like to donate tonight for those, I'll give you some instructions in a little bit, and you can receive the audio video for that as well. Now, one thing that I should mention is that Gemini Brett's audio video actually, you know, a little Mercury retrograde action, uh, was there was a it was corrupted file afterward and we were trying to work it out with the go-to meeting uh tech people and you know to no avail so we actually rescheduled um gemini brett for a repeat of the same talk next wednesday night so next wednesday night um on august 15th at 7 p.m eastern time to 9 p.m eastern time gemini brett will be back giving the same talk and that way, a lot of people who ordered the talk will still be able to get it. We'll just do a repeat of it. So if you weren't able to make that and you'd like to see it live, come on out next Wednesday evening, uh, 7 o'clock. I'll be sending out information about that in a newsletter. You can see um, an update about that. Uh, I'll be announcing on my newsletter and Facebook page and you know all my different social media outlets, however you've connected with me in the first place. Just check that channel and it, you know probably I'll post pretty soon about that. So those two talks were awesome. You can get the recordings for those. I'm gonna tell you more about our speaker tonight who uh, in a little bit, Moses, who's giving a talk called Vedic Astrology for Western Astrologers. That's our main event tonight. But before I do that, I just wanna let you guys know how you can donate for either the two talks that came before tonight's talk and most importantly for tonight's talk. So um, I'm gonna take you to the payments and donations uh, tab of my website. I'm going to put it in the chat box right now so that you can uh, reach it for yourself. There it is. Um, you're going to use the donate button on the website and the suggested donation for this evening is 15 to $25. Now if you can do more than that we ask that you do and if you can't do the suggested range just do the best you can. 
Um, if you can't make any donation, please feel free to just be here with us and learn and study. And then perhaps in a future um, class, you can uh, donate more or uh, get a reading with Moses sometime down the line when you when you have a little extra funds or whatever. Um, or just pay it forward and teach someone something about astrology that you learned tonight. Um, all of our speaker series events are by donation and everything that we earn goes directly to our speakers tonight. And the basic reason for this is, um, comes from, you know, my sort of, uh, yoga practice, the seva or service is a very important part of, um, how we cultivate our, our sort of yogic path. So being of service to other people in the world and, trying to be of service to the community is something that I'm passionate about. And this is one of the ways that I try to sort of embody that spirit of service. So everything goes to our speakers and it goes to supporting their good work, um, you know, in the, in the world and in uh, their own astrology um, careers. The other reason that I think that this is really important that I, uh, I like to ring the donation bell loudly during the event, I'll kind of keep pinging everyone saying, Hey, let's donate if you haven't yet is that um, for all, many people who are here studying astrology with an intention to perhaps practice at some point. And when you do so, I think you'll you'll find very quickly that, you know, you, you really have to hustle and grind when you are your own boss, when you're your own employee, et cetera. So um, we, uh, by supporting others who are doing that, that we're learning from, um, we are really creating better karma for ourselves in a sense as astrologers. And um, we are, also um, uh, putting in good intentions into our own work. So that's how I encourage everybody to think about that and ask you again to just uh, donate generously tonight if you um, if you are able to. If not, use the use the range 15 to 25. And if you can't do that, um, again, just do the best you can. Now, um, if for any reason you have to leave the talk tonight and you're not able to attend the whole thing, um, you can email me for a copy of the audio video afterward at nightlightastrology at gmail.com. So that's how you get in touch uh, with me for the audio video and I'll send it to you afterward. So that's what I, uh, that's all I have to say. I'm gonna introduce our speaker now and we're gonna get into it. Um, so uh, Moses Siragar is giving a talk tonight called Vedic Astrology for Western Astrologers. I actually first heard about um, Moses through one of my colleagues, um, Chris Brennan. Um, Chris had uh, Moses on one of his sort of recent episodes of the astrology podcast. And I found the talk like really wonderful. And, um, and then I, Moses and I had sort of connected. I don't remember somehow in Facebook world, we connected and I just was also getting ready to go to India and, um, for a East kind of East meets West sort of astrology conference and some study in, uh, Bhakti yoga and stuff like that. And, you know, Moses, as someone who's um, practicing uh, Vedic astrology, uh, just sort of appeared. And I think the universe, you know, had a hand in that. So I was like, hey, this is really cool. And, you know, wanted to get him on and get, get a talk going. And he one of the talks that he proposed was, you know, Vedic astrology for Western astrologers. And I was like, hey, that sounds perfect because, you know, many of us are probably pretty committed to continuing. You know, we might not be able to take up the project of like fully committing to Vedic astrology, but we want to know something about it. What's it like? What? How does? What's the paradigm like? So Moses is going to give us a crash course tonight, and I'm really excited about that. Let me tell you a little bit about Moses from his um, bio. So Moses loves the interplay of Western and Vedic astrology in his full-time practice. He specializes in locational astrology from an East-West perspective. The featured uh, 123rd of the episode of the Astrology Podcast. You can check that out too. Uh, Moses was the first president of the Association for Young Astrologers. He organizes the Blast Astrology Conference in Sedona. I hope you'll tell us a little bit more about that at the end. And he hopes to <clears throat> host another conference soon. Um, you can follow his astrolog astrological Facebook updates at his page, Astrology the Cosmic Mirror, and his recently remodeled website, astrologyforthesoul.com. I'm going to put those into the chat box so that you can find them uh, right now. Um, so I'm uh, very happy to have you here, Moses, and I'm going to hand it over to you now. Okay, great. Let's see here. So I need to share my screen. All right. Can you guys hear me? Hello, hello. 
Well, Adam, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm going to assume right now, let's go ahead and just put, um, I'll put the real-time clock up. This is actually tropical right now, <laughs> but uh, let me know in the chat if you guys can see that okay. I'll check the chat here. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, great, great, great. Thank you, guys. Well, really, thank you all for being here. Um, this is fun. I haven't given a lot of talks in recent years. I spoke down in Scottsdale earlier this year, but otherwise, I have not done a whole lot of that. So, um, so yeah, this is great. This is really great. Um, I actually thought we would start with something, um, a part of the Hindu tradition, just with uh, chanting a bit. And I thought we could just do a simple chant. Um, and this is just a simple chant to Lord Ganesha, who is connected with astrology. He's also the remover of obstacles, you may have heard. So he's often uh, a deity that uh, you know Hinduism would be um, you know, honored before you begin something, to sort of begin in an auspicious way. Um, so I have I've used this actually this mantra um, a lot over the years, and it's been my sort of like get the car to start kind of mantra that uh, you know has been good for some little miracles and stuff like that. So um, I think it's uh, you know if you don't have a Hindu mantra and you want to play with one, uh, I'm not a guru. I can't sort of give you some sort of incredible mantra transmission, but um, but this is a, a nice simple. Um, mantra. And because this is about removing obstacles, and um, Adam is also embarking on a new phase of life with another child, uh, if you want to kind of keep him and his family in mind as you chant this as well, I will send blessings to his family and, um, you know, invoke Lord Ganesha. So the chant is simply Om. Om, of course, is more like an A-U-M. It's almost like a three-part sound. Om, right? So you've got Om and then Gum, which is like a seed mantra. It's like just a one-syllable mantra that's like a short version of uh, Ganesh or Ganapati. And then Ganapati, yay, we're talking about Ganesha, and Namaha, or Nama, it's a, you know, a salutation, an offering, a bowing. Um, so we're basically uh, invoking the divine, and we're just honoring Lord Ganesha. So a lot of times in Hinduism, we do things in, in uh, multiples of nine. So we might do this 18 times or something like that. Um, so you can do this, you know, you can just listen, or you can do it out loud wherever you happen to be. And uh, again, I'm I'm chanting this not only for Adam and his family, but also for for our lecture tonight and for everyone who is here tonight. Okay. All right, sounds good. So I'll just I'll do that along with you guys. Um, all right. So we'll start with three ohms, and then we'll chant this a little bit. Oh. Namaha Om Gam Ganapataye 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 Namaha All right. This is um, uh, a little CD. I used to be able to get this off of Dennis Flaherty's website. <clears throat> Actually, not Dennis Flaherty, the other Dennis. I'm sorry, I'm mixing up some names. James Kelleher. James Kelleher, uh, James Kelleher has um, a CD with these 
uh, Bija mantras for the planets. So there's um, Sun, Moon, <coughs> Mars, Mercury, Jupiter, Venus, Saturn, Rahu, and K2. And if you want to play around with some astrological energies, um, you know, play around is probably the wrong wrong term. Um, it's actually a very sacred way to kind of connect to those energies. And you can, I have experimented with them. I love to experiment with things, right? So I remember um, chanting a Mars mantra a lot one day. And then next thing I knew, all of the most manly men in my life sort of appeared that day and sort of I had, you know, experiences with them. And so you kind of invoke the energy uh, when you do that. Working with mantras is also not something I recommend a lot. It's not something I, I do. I'm not a guru again. Um, but it is something that Vedic astrologers often recommend as a kind of a, a remedial measure. That's one of the cool things about Vedic astrology. Um, we don't have a lot of remedial measures these days in, uh, in Western astrology. You know, people used to make talismans and things like that. And some people still do, um, but it's not that common, right? So that's one of the things I really like about Vedic astrology is that you look at your chart and maybe you've got some karma that you're dealing with this year or something like that. Um, at least there are some things you can do. And one of them is mantra. I, I, again, I don't use mantra a lot in my practice with clients. Some clients might uh, be comfortable with mantra already. All right. In that case, they might really enjoy it. They might really kind of get off on that. But, you know, you can see on the back of the CD, you know, as a remedial measure, well, if you need to propitiate mercury, you're in luck. You only have to chant that 4,000 times, according to the CD. Um, if you're working on Saturn, you got 23,000 that you got to do. So uh, those mantras are not going to say themselves. You've got to do the work. That's why it's a bit hard to, uh, to work with those, because it takes a lot of effort. And um, most people, frankly, probably won't put in that time to do that kind of work. But there are some people, you know, I've worked with clients who have worked with mantra and they um, they put in the hours, they put in the work and they, they notice, you know, results. Um, I'll show you one of the things I have used a lot. And this is one thing you can do. Um, anyone can do this, actually. So let me just show you what this is real quick. This is my spiritual teacher. There's Amma, a little picture of Amma. She's famously the hugging saint. And I've been seeing her since... 1995, um, most years since then. And so she's got a lot of wonderful things going. She's uh, quite the humanitarian, quite the humanitarian. And um, and really, you know, to a lot of people, she is a, a really fully realized being as well. Um, so she's, for example, fed all three of my children their first food. You know, it's like a very special relationship. So um, what's cool about her, though, she, well, many things are cool about her, I should say. What's cool about this little piece of... Uh, her website is you can order pujas from this website. So let's say you're having a really nasty Saturn transit or something like that. You know, you can go on here and you can actually order what's called a puja. And a puja is a kind of a ritual ceremony that's conducted by, you know, I, I've seen a lot of the brahmacharis, you know, these people who do these, um, the pujaris, these really like incredibly potent beings, um, you know, kind of white magicians, right, who are just totally devoted to their spiritual path. And you literally go to the website, you can put in your name and your and uh, your birthday, birthplace, birth time. It'll ask you for your birth star. I don't think you need it, but that's the, the nakshatra of your moon. So the nakshatras are one of the primordial zodiacs, actually. Uh, the, the circle, uh, you know, the ecliptic uh, was split into 27 pieces. Um, by the Indians a long, long time ago, very long time ago, actually, thousands of years ago. And uh, with the idea being basically the moon would travel through one every day. It's 27. The moon takes about, you know, 27 days to go just around the zodiac, right? Not 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 new moon to new moon, but just around the zodiac. So, um, so you get the moon going through one of these each day. And these are really great because they're all connected with um, different deities in the in the Hindu you know, kind of pantheon of different stories like that. So anyway, that's what the birth star is. But literally anyone can do this because if you know, for example, that, you know, Saturn is kicking your butt all year, um, you could do pujas for Saturn. And what I like about hers, in addition to the fact that I'm connected with her, she does a lot of um, nonprofit work. So I feel like the money goes to a good place. Um, absolutely. She does incredible charitable work. Well, they, they have pujas for the uh, the Hindu deities and things like that. You know, you can do a puja for, well, here's one, Navagraha, the nine planets. That one's actually really cool. I think that one's about 250, but the planetary ones are 35. 
I've done I've done like many many of these and they're they're actually quite incredible. So like Lakshmi Puja for abundance or Saraswati, um, if you're you know getting into a new field of study something like that. So anyway, um, let's say you need a Saturn Puja. It's thirty five dollars. You fill out the info. Uh, over in India, you've got someone who's doing this really incredible thing, and they send you this packet of sacred ash with a little sugar candy in it and stuff like that. And it's it's carrying the the energy of that puja. The first time I tried one of these pujas, um, it was really an experiment. And so I did a Saturn puja for my wife and myself. Uh, in our Vedic charts, my wife and I, um, we Saturn rules the fifth house for both of us. And we got pregnant. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. I think it was a Saturn and Lakshmi puja perhaps together. So that was uh, one of Amma's ways of showing me that the pujas actually do work. Um, yeah, Lord of the fifth house for both of us. I think that was the first time we had done them. And pretty quickly we were pregnant there. So that's unusual. Uh, that's not the normal situation. But, um, uh, you know, really what's cool about the pujas, as opposed to what, say, the mantras or gemstones or other things like that, the pujas you can't really hurt yourself with. Um, obviously, you'll spend a little money here. Um, that does support charitable, beautiful, you know, work around the world. But these are they're like prayers, really, you know. Um, you know, when they do the ritual, you know, they, they may have fire and they're pouring milk and honey and flowers and beautiful things everywhere. Um, it's really just a beautiful ritual. And so it's it's sort of like it's just prayer. It, it's really just like prayer. So you can't really hurt yourself with these. That's what I like about these. You, you can't ever feel worried that, oh, no, I recommended a, a Jupiter puja to someone like that's not going to hurt them. <laughs> There's no way that's going to hurt them, in my opinion. Um, and it's it's really like a way of contacting a bit of grace, I think. So I love that they have a, a spiritual, they wouldn't call it magical, but I'll call it magical, right? It's like a spiritual, magical sort of way of working directly with astrological energy. Maybe that's a little bit like, um, how many for the moon someone had asked earlier? Maybe that's a bit like, um, uh, you know, in the West, again, with the, uh, you know, amulets and things that people would make, some of the astrological magic. But it's a it's a cool it's a cool version of it, and this is pretty accessible. The moon was uh, eleven thousand times you would be chanting for the moon, Om Hrim Chandraya Namaha. So that would be honoring the moon there. Um, and I love that that um, awareness of Vedic astrology uh, and and remedial measures. And again, pujas are one of the main things that I work with. I also work with gemstones a little bit. I don't want to talk about that too much, but um, I'll give you an example. I wear a, uh, a little green stone there. You can see it's kind of a, it's a green tourmaline. Okay. Now uh, the back of the stone, uh, the back of the little pendant, um, the, the gem itself kind of has a little point at the back. So it, it's worn near my heart and it touches my heart. So um, with gemstones, a lot of times you, you, you don't want to wear the gemstones typically. Um, they're very strong actually. And with a lot of clients, I can't even find a, plant, a, a gemstone I would recommend for them to wear because it's like turning the volume up on that planet a lot. And you you want that to be a, a planet that is already connected with a lot of auspiciousness in the chart because it will increase that auspiciousness. So if you can find that chart um, or rather that planet uh, in, in a chart, then you can experiment with wearing you know a gemstone. So back when Saturn went stationary in tropical Leo way back when, think back then, uh, it, it sat down on my sun and... Um, I remember seeing my, my spiritual teacher at that time, and I, I got this little gemstone, and she blessed it and and uh, put it on me. And I'm born with Mercury about four degrees past the sun, right? So it's separating, but it's technically combust, which is a thing in Vedic astrology too, by the way. So there is, you know, an affliction there to Mercury because of that. So ever since I've worn that Mercury gemstone, I noticed, for example, my mind is a lot um, more even keeled. You know, I used to be more hot tempered and get into more arguments with people and stuff like that. It's a kind of a Mercury sun thing potentially. Um, and uh, Mercury in my Vedic chart rules my ninth house and my 12th house. So I'm a Libra rising in Vedic astrology. Okay. So um, I noticed it really improved my spiritual life. My relationship with my spiritual teacher became much stronger. I had a lot less sort of questions and doubts. I was just more open to receiving some kind of grace, you know, through my teacher. So I've worn this stone ever since then and, you know, hope to wear it as long as I can. So it's another thing that you can do in Vedic astrology. You have to be really careful with those. Don't don't recommend the gemstones if you don't know what you're doing. 
Um, and even if you do, you do it cautiously. And you say, well, you could try this. You could wear it for a month or something and see if your life gets better. If it does, great. If not, take it off, <laughs> you know. And I will give you a quick story on that one, too. So I one time went to see Ama. We were in uh, New Mexico. I believe it was Santa Fe um, and or Albuquerque. Actually, it might have been Albuquerque. She goes back and forth a little bit. And anyway, um, I I got a um, a little bracelet and it had a tiger's eye on it. And tiger's eye is one of the stones connected with K2. K2 is the south node of the moon in uh, Hindu astrology. And um, I don't know what would be the best screen to leave up right now. So I'll just do this. Um, so anyway, a K2 stone. So it was a really, it was like one of those little like stones you could buy for a dollar, you know, and it had a hole drilled through it for the bracelet. So I thought it just wouldn't have any effect. So I put it on, I actually had her bless it and then put it on. And three days later, I couldn't see out of my left eye. It was so dry, like the weather was so dry, I could not keep the eye open. And I realized, oh, I'm wearing the stone for K2, which afflicts that particular eye in my chart. So I took it off. <laughs> and three days later, I could see normally again. Um, that was another lesson that Ama taught me, I think, uh, indirectly, uh, about the power of a gemstone and the power of a gemstone when she kind of blesses it and empowers it. Um, and the nice thing about that, if you go see her, you can see her for free uh, around the U.S. and Europe. She goes every year. And if you have her like bless a stone for you, you don't have to buy an expensive stone. You know, you can spend, sure, you can buy a diamond and a yellow sapphire and all this really expensive stuff, uh, depending on the planet you want to work with. But I've learned, you know, you can give her a stone, you know, apparently a, a $1 tiger's eye, give it to her and bless it and it'll really empower that stone. Um, so they're fun. That's a whole other thing, right? And this is just getting into this, this great diversity that is Vedic astrology. I mean, we're talking about India, right? How many gods are there in India, right? How many languages are there in India? I mean, it's just a land of just of just diversity. And Vedic astrology, you know, in the West at least, it is surprisingly relatively uniform. Of course, there are lots of schools, there are lots of traditions, lots of things. But you'd be surprised, you know, how much um, we seem to be able to agree on a lot of things. And it depends on which sort of system you're using. Um, but the 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 text from uh, Parashara, which is from like the seventh and eighth century, uh, which is a really deep in depth text. You know, that's the one you're going to see a lot of people using in the West. So we can really agree on a whole lot of stuff, which is, which is really nice. Um, let me just check in with the chat and just see how we're doing here. So they say a certain number of prayers based upon the planet and then charge accordingly a prayer just for me. It's a, it's actually a, a really elaborate ritual when they do the puja. Um, really beautiful. They have to set all this stuff up. They've got to do all this incredible work to make everything just absolutely perfect. You know, they're going to use um, certain mudras with their hands. They're going to use certain mantras that are ancient in Sanskrit. They're going to propitiate the gods in certain ways. So, um, you know, I bet you those guys get, get really uh, kind of high off of that because it's just some incredible energy. I've sat there and, you know, been a part of those um, pujas before. And it's real sacred stuff. It's really sacred stuff. So could I recommend a, a reference for gemstone remediations? Um, I think you should talk to someone maybe about, um, you know, which stones might work for you. That's something I, I am very comfortable with, like looking at a chart and at least coming up with, you know, the best recommendations if there are any. And again, with some clients, I might say, I don't think there's a stone that you should try to wear. Um, and people will have some different opinions on this certainly. Um, but basically, the ideal candidate for a gemstone would be a planet that's more naturally benefic. So I wear Mercury, right? Because Mercury in Vedic astrology is considered basically a benefic. Uh, if it's in association with malefics, it can become more malefic, but basically a benefic. Um, if it's under some sort of hard aspect, so like Mercury's close to the sun in my case, um, and does it rule, for example, good houses? So it rules my ninth house. Um, so this is, a, you know, an idea of strengthening the planet, giving Mercury some strength to help it deal with that, that combustion from the sun, um, strengthen the ninth house, uh, for example, which, you know, which it rules. So you don't want the planet to look too bad off, right? Um, by itself, you know, uh, because you, you risk increasing the negative sort of significations of that. It's kind of a long story, but 
uh, that's kind of a, a rough idea of what we want to do there. And you might find that wearing some of those stones really, you know, really changes your life. But that's pretty strong medicine, honestly. It's real strong stuff. Um, I would compare it in, in a lot of ways to living on an astrocartography line, right? You go live on a Mars line or a Mercury line, you're really increasing the potency and of that planet in your life. And you're increasing the volume on that planet in your life. And that may not be the planet you want to increase the volume on. Uh, that's uh, a lot of my work, is, as Adam said, was with locational work. That's a whole other talk, of course, but you'll find, for example, people will move to a planetary line. They'll move right to it because they think they're supposed to. They think, oh, astrocartography says I'm supposed to move to my Jupiter line or my sun line. No, not necessarily. <laughs> um, and it, that is a pretty common misconception, but be careful because a lot of times uh, you don't want to live right on top of your planetary lines because they're so strong. It's like wearing a gemstone. It's so powerful and you have to really have a good planet, a really good planet uh, to do that. Otherwise, it can be a little bit, a uh, little bit intense, or very intense. So anyway, um, I have a whole kind of smorgasbord of topics, and I, I hope to, um, you know, give you guys some stuff to really work with tonight. I'm real practical. I like to give out real practical stuff too. So we're kind of getting into some general stuff here. But um, uh, you're welcome, uh, Karen. Yeah. Um, all right. So anyway, let's talk a little bit about the, uh, one of the elephants in the room. Um, Glenn Perry actually started his talk at the Indian conference with this idea of the elephant in the room. If you don't know about that, uh, Glenn Perry gave a talk at an Indian conference on the Zodiac conundrum, right? And this was it turned out to be a real controversial talk. Uh, a lot of people felt he was disrespectful. I would agree based on what I read in the transcript. Um, disrespectful to where he was in India and essentially arguing that you can't do tropical and sidereal both. It has to be one or the other. And he used like a real simple logic thing to try to make that case. Um, and, uh, and anyway, it caused him a lot of problems. And um, I, I wasn't, I was fine with that because I thought it was really rude. And I thought, I thought he was wrong, you know, absolutely wrong. Um, there are, so let me give you a little bit of background on myself. I started with Western astrology. Uh, that is absolutely my roots, right? So I uh, was a teenager and my mom told me some stuff about my chart one night. I thought, how the heck do you know that about me? And so I started reading all of her books, right? She had, I don't know, um, Isabel Hickey and Rob Hand and, you know, all these books laying around. And we had astrology software and an old dot matrix printer. And so I, I printed out all these charts of all the friends and family I knew and started reading their charts just to make sure that my mom was full of crap, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm 43. I'm, I'm still here doing astrology, by the way. Um, uh, actually, I, I pulled out some fun books. Uh, I will show you this real quick. This is kind of fun. This is um, Looking at Astrology by Liz Green. So my mom had me reading this when I was uh, a little kid. And I didn't know about this until uh, I was in college. I had forgotten it. And then I found it in the basement one day. And uh, I'll see if the video can kind of capture this. But you're about to see all the kids in my first grade class and their like, sun signs next to their names. So let's see. There we go. Wait a minute. Yep, there they are. Okay, Seiko was a Sag. I was really kind of, I really kind of had a little crush on her. Cute little Japanese girl. I remember these kids a little bit. Um, you can see Frank was a Libra. That was the kid who convinced me that he had an underground lair full of um, beautiful women, and if I let him uh, copy like my homework and off my paper for tests, that he would let me hang out in his underground lair with all these beautiful women. So I was down for that. I thought it was a great idea, uh, but I never did get to see them, so that was a little disappointing. So. Frank was a Libra, apparently. So, um, so anyway, that's how I got started, right? I was doing astrology. My mom was studying astrology when I was in. She was. In, uh, I was in the womb. Sorry. Um, I was running around Madeline Hillistonine's living room when my mom was taking classes with her. And then, you know, by the time I was a teenager, I thought she was crazy for being into astrology. So, uh, but I got into it, obviously, and I, I realized there was a whole lot to it. And then it was really awfully helpful to me. So I wanted to really help other people with it too. So. Um, I didn't really start with Vedic astrology. I, in fact, very much modern Western astrology, which I still use every day. I still love any kind of astrology, right? I, I think I have a point of view, having gotten into Vedic astrology, um, which Dennis Harness introduced me to, um, you know, some years later. He's he's like the starter drug for a lot of people with astrology, with Vedic astrology. You know, um, Chris Brandon was interviewing him recently, um, talking about how you know at Kepler he learned from Dennis. And so Dennis is like the Johnny Appleseed. He got a lot of us into Vedic astrology. And one of the nice things that happens when you study another kind of astrology is you start to kind of 
break your attachment to seeing things a certain way. Um, you know, oh, I am a this sign and I have this in this house. And, you know, it, it, if you just kind of study one kind of astrology, you, you, I can tell you for sure, you run this risk of getting this real narrow vision of things and, and kind of projecting a little too much based on that. I like having a little bit of flexibility where you can see uh, different things. Um, and it, it makes you more open-minded to things too. Now back to this issue of, of the zodiacs. So I, I do have kind of a way of explaining how I think that they work together. And it's a, you know, it's it's, it's not uh, stone tablets here, but it's um, I think it's a good idea for how it works basically. So the and and there is a difference, right? Think of the difference between the sidereal zodiac and the tropical zodiac. Okay. So imagine what it's like to see the stars at night, right? You go see Scorpio up in the sky. You see Orion, you see a constellation, okay? When you see the planets in a sidereal perspective, in a sidereal zodiac, that's what you're looking at, right? You're looking at Mars. Oh, well, Mars right now is in Capricorn in, you know, what we would say is sidereal astrology. Uh, it's still zero Aquarius, right, in tropical astrology. But you're looking at it at that kind of great distance. Now, the tropical zodiac is based on round, the Earth's relationship to the Sun, our seasons, and the Earth's sort of turning points in its relationship to the Sun as it goes around the Sun. So the seasons are very tropical. So think about the difference between experiencing winter, right? Imagine, imagine for a minute winter. Imagine you're feeling winter, right? Imagine you're feeling summer. Maybe not hard for some of you to imagine at this point. Uh, spring, fall, right? That's tropical astrology. Now, is the summer real? Is the winter real? Oh, yeah. Can you feel it? Oh, yeah. Um, when you meet someone and you kind of get to uh, a feeling for them, like as a person, um, this is just real time clock. I'm not really sure what to leave on the screen, so I'm just going to keep changing it. Um, you experience that feeling. When you experience a person, I think you mostly experience them in a tropical way. You come up and meet me somewhere, you're meeting you know, my Scorpio rising in, in tropical astrology or my Leo sun sign or my cancer moon, okay? Sidereal astrology is more, in, in many ways, I think more objective and tropical is more subjective. That is not to say that one is better than the other in any respect, really. I think, though, that the sidereal is, is more of that distant view. So if you look at me from a great distance, right? Let's say you know me from a great distance. Maybe you've seen my website or something like that. You're, you're really seeing, just like you would see the distant stars, you're seeing more of a sidereal, sidereal view of someone when you know them in these sort of general terms. So it, it's, I don't want to say that sidereal is not psychological. And I don't want to say that tropical is not objective because there's a lot of overlap and it's a funny bit of overlap um, how these things happen. So the distinctions are somewhat artificial. They're not hard and fast, you know? And, you know, you could say things like, well, some of the psychology of the sidereal zodiac comes in more through things like the nakshatras. If you do Vedic astrology, you know, your moon, your sun, your ascendant will be in a nakshatra. And that nakshatra is connected to a god or goddess or some kind of mythology. And there's a story there and there's a psychology there. So, you know, so I do want to really say that it's not a hard and fast distinction, but there is a, there is a difference there. And I would say the same thing is true of um, house systems like whole sign houses. Whole sign houses to me are the equivalent of sidereal astrology in a house reference. In other words, it's the most objective view of someone. I think that's one of the reasons why whole sign houses have become a lot more popular because it, it works in a very objective way, a very noticeable way. They're great, right? I would say by that logic or argument, the ultimate objective view of someone is sidereal and whole sign houses, which by the way is what Vedic astrology, uh, everyone practically in Vedic astrology is doing that. They're using sidereal zodiac and whole sign houses. That's pretty standard. Whereas I would say the ultimate tropical, um, sorry, the ultimate psychological astrology is tropical zodiac and more quadrant-based house systems. Um, 
you see that. You see a lot of the modern psychological astrologers that use what I think are really strange house systems like Placidus. Okay. Um, I use, by the way, when I use quadrant systems, I use Porphyry for a lot of reasons. Porphyry trisects the quadrants equally. It works super freaking well. I've been using it all my whole career as an astrologer. And it, it, you don't have like these extreme weird things at extreme latitude, like someone's eighth house being five times bigger than their seventh house and weird stuff like that. But anyway, I think you can, you can kind of mix the two, right? A lot of people today do tropical uh, and whole signs. That's pretty popular these days. And I think that's an absolutely great way to go. Um, and it kind of combines the psychological, which we can really relate to, that's tropical, with the objective truth of the life, which is basically what the whole signs are going to show you. So there's different um, different tools here, you know, and you know, for example, uh, I had someone the other day um, on after like I, I did an astrology update, and I didn't, you know, a tropical piece, and I did a sidereal piece because to me, I use these things interchangeably. Like I'm so comfortable using these things interchangeably. I'm so, I mean, convinced isn't the right word. I just know these things work as they as I know them to work. So I use them both just you know, without even really thinking of the conversion so much, I'm going back and forth. My mind is just used to that. So anyway, I, I made this post and she said, did you have any, you know, Gemini in your chart <laughs> or any, uh, I think she said Aquarius, but I think Libra would have been a better, uh, you know, guess at that point because in sidereal astrology, I'm a Libra rising. Now my personality is not a Libra. If you get to know me personally and you know what a tropical Libra feels like, I'm not that. It's not that at all. Right, I'm a Scorpio rising. I'm absolutely a Scorpio rising. That's my tropical ascendant, right? That's the the season of me, right? The, remember, the tropical zodiac is very seasonal. It, you feel it, you know. You feel the heat, you know. You feel the humidity. You feel the seasons here on Earth. Okay, that's like tropical astrology. More so is like that. Um, but am I am I Libran in some sort of objective sense? Well, I've been married for 18 years. I'm very much about, well, you have to do Western and you have to do Vedic and you have to do sidereal and you have to do tropical. And really in astrology, I find myself doing that constantly, just all the time. I find myself getting in situations where astrologers tend to assume it has to be this or it has to be this, right? We, we have to use the mean node calculation or the true node calculation. We have to calculate solar arcs this way or that way. And astrologers just love to get hung up on those either ors and fight it out over them. And it's pretty silly from my point of view. Um, and so I'm, I'm always that guy who's like, eh, maybe, maybe it's both guys. Maybe they both work. Let's try it out and see. Um, that's just really instinctual for me. Right. So I'm very much always, always about seeing, you know, the other side to things, um, and trying to integrate those things. And if you're hearing dogs barking, I think my family's coming home and I think the dogs are really excited about it. So, um, I'm going to, I'm going to go get a dog out. Uh, I'll be right back. All right, so in Vedic astrology, my moon sign is Gemini. I'm not a, like a Gemini, and not like a tropical Gemini at all. If you get to know me, it's not really my personality. My moon is Cancer. I'm much more like a Cancer because, hey, guess what? My moon is actually in Cancer. Um, but in a very objective sense, does my life look like a Gemini? Probably yes, right? I, I, I tend to always kind of be juggling. Oh, I can do a little bit of this and a little bit of that, right? Got the Western, got the Vedic. Oh, by the way, I, I kind of took some time, you know, I, I stepped back from being an astrologer for a while and I wrote two, two um, epic fantasy novels that were inspired by like mythology and stuff like that. Um, oh, I decided to oh, go pick up a massage certification a few years ago, did that. So I'm always kind of doing that Gemini kind of thing. And yet not really with a Gemini sort of personality. Um, similarly, my sun sign is Leo. Okay. So I've got the personality in a lot of ways of a Leo, but if you look at my Vedic chart, I've got the sun and Saturn and Mercury in cancer in the 10th house. So objectively, am I some sort of cancer sort of person? Well, yeah, I'm very much like a family man. I've got three kids. You know, if you follow my Facebook, I'm always posting picture, pictures of my kids. Uh, I'm, you know, a big brother to, to some kids. I you know, do another cancer thing like Adam does, right? Trying to bring people together, create community. That's why I had the Blast Astrology Conference, which we did a couple of about a dozen years ago. And uh, it was really all about bringing together young and old and Vedic and Western and ancient and modern and bring everybody together, basically, 
and let's create this community. Let's bring everybody together. That's actually a very cancer thing to do, very lunar kind of thing to do. So objectively, I'm the guy who sort of brings people together, exactly like what Adam does with his, you know, his speaker series. Um, Adam, interestingly, um, this is just like a sidereal chart. His son is still in cancer, right? If you go to Vedic astrology, sun sign is still cancer, uh, zero, you know, just just there. North node is cancer. Venus is cancer. So no matter which way you look at him, he's got that cancer thing going on. Sun and Mercury in cancer in tropical. So, you know, he, he's sort of bringing people together like that. Um, so that's hopefully a little introduction to how these things can kind of be, well, both operating at the same time, right? And think about the distance between looking at, you know, Adam from a distance. Here he is sidereally, right? You know, um, Moon and Sag, right? So he's he's he would have in his Vedic chart, he would have Moon and Sag in the ninth house, whole signs. So he's bringing this incredibly uplifting kind of spiritual perspective to astrology, which I find astrology shows up in the eighth house. For me personally, more than any other house, it shows up in the eighth, although I know the arguments for the ninth house and, and the tenth house. Those are valid too, um, right? And so he's bringing um, this real positive message there. And I think that you work with it like that and you start to see some of those object objective realities for people. And here's really one of the one of the biggest things I would say to you you know, pull up a chart, use a, a sidereal zodiac, and use whole sign houses. Just make it make it simple on yourself. So let's do this here. We'll, we'll edit Adam here. Whole signs, okay. Groovy. All right. So this is just a whole sign sidereal chart. You could play around with this, right? Look look at the chart. Look at all the things that you like to look at. You might look at transits or study the natal chart or whatever you do, and. Um, you know, see, think of things in some sort of objective context, uh, again, for sidereal astrology. And you'll find that you can play around with this. I mean, there were sidereal,ists, of course, in the West, too. Cyril Fagan, I've come to discover, is really one of the real genius, brilliant astrologers of our time. I mean, he's before my time, I guess, but uh, sort of our era, right? Um, a lot of the, the key insights from, I guess he wasn't that long ago, really, because a lot of the key insights from... Uh, Astrocartography, that's one of the things I learned. They came kind of through Cyril Fagan, actually, to um, Jim Lewis. And so Cyril Fagan was absolutely a sidereal-ist. He thought the sidereal zodiac just thought it worked better. And so I look at the astrological community and I see you have the people who are so into tropical and they think the sidereal zodiac is obviously an error. And believe me, you'll see the same thing on the other side of the fence. People who are absolutely convinced that the sidereal zodiac makes sense, which in a way is kind of the more obvious thing, isn't it? Like the sidereal zodiac, like, oh, there's Mars. It's in, you know, Capricorn or whatever. In a way, I think that's actually the more, by far the most obvious um, approach to take initially. And so a lot of people who, who are sidereal, like they come from Vedic astrology typically, they will not... Um, they'll not be able to wrap their head on why should I be using the seasons of the Northern Hemisphere, you know, in parentheses, the seasons to determine where the zodiac signs are. I can see exactly where the planet is in the sky, right? And, all right, so you've got people on both sides thinking, well, I'm right and you're wrong. <laughs> okay, guess what, <laughs> right? It's pretty obvious, right? You take one step back and I think you can see what's going on. All of it works. It, and and there, this works a certain way and this works a certain way. They actually work together. There's no reason why they can't, and a lot of the techniques, you know, cross apply between different kinds of astrology, even just Vedic and Western astrology. So to me, that that's really a no-brainer. And I'm sorry, I know it's not a no-brainer to a lot of people. Uh, so I don't mean to be like sort of dismissive about that, but I, I think it's so obvious. <laughs> I think it's just so incredibly obvious that we don't have God knows how many people who study Vedic astrology in the world who are very much sidereal, right? Um, we don't, the, all of those people are not wrong. Okay. Just as all of the people in the West going to UAC and, you know, doing their, uh, their conferences and the, all their studies here, those people are not wrong, right? They're, they're tuned into something. They're touching a part of the elephant and it's a little different part of the elephant than the other guy. So to me, it's always a matter of finding how these things can work together because they do. And, and luckily they do. And it's just beautiful to see. You know, as, as amazing as, as astrology already is in one zodiac, it just takes on more and more incredible dimensions the further you go. 
let me take a break here and just see what kind of questions we have here. Um, so I'm going to skip that question, Deidre, about the um, the gemstone. If you have a heavy load for a planet or sign in their chart, would it be beneficial? I'm just assuming that's for the gemstone. Um, complicated, complicated. Karen, thank you for uh, appreciating the chanting. I know, I know. We get to sit here and chant the whole time. <laughs> that might be the most beneficial thing, right? So, um, all right. So, any questions at this point? I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a drink of water here. So let me just throw out um, various cool things. Um, no problem. So um, one of the one of the coolest concepts in Vedic astrology is the maturity of the planets. So you guys might have heard of the the twenty seven club, right, or whatever that is. Let me just Google this real, real quick here. Is that, isn't that what it's called? Brian Jones, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, Jim Morrison all died at the age of twenty seven, between sixty nine and seventy one. Um, at the time, the coincidence gave rise to some comment, but it was not until the 94 death of Kurt Cobain at 27 that the idea of a 27 club began to catch on in public perception. All righty. This is a very cool concept from Vedic Astrology. It's just one little concept, but it's a very, very cool concept. The idea is at certain ages, planets mature in your chart. And what happens is at that age, you get the result of that planet. It, it, it sort of gives its fruit right? Whatever fruit it promises in the chart, it pops. It pops at that time. For example, let's look at Mars. So Mars's peak effect is at 28. That means it's from the 27th birthday. So when you say, I'm 27, that's the year Mars is maturing in your chart. That's the year it's going to deliver its, its promise in the chart. So um, I've never seen a better explanation, really. I have looked at some of those guys' charts and at their Marses. It's been a while, so I won't comment on that. I do remember seeing some things that made sense. And you have all these folks, you know, having that sort of year. So when you're 24, you're having a Venus year, right? When you're 27, you're having a Mars year. I've noticed a lot of people when they're 31, like writing books and doing really mercurial things. I believe that's around the time. Let me think. Uh, yeah, that's the year I did the first BLAST conference uh, was when I was 31. So my Vedic Mercury, Mercury in Cancer in the 10th house with the Sun and Saturn. So I organized a, an astrology conference and that was a great thing. It was a great thing in my life. Um, I also had my first kid that year, which was also cool. And um, 35 is a fun one because that's, that's when your Saturn matures. So, you know, you're not really like, you can't really be a king, can't really be a grown-up until 35. The Saturn return gets it going, but around 35, you start kind of coming into your own. And um, the the 35 year for me, Saturn rules the uh, fifth house of my chart. So when I was 35, I was finishing up, I believe, the first novel that I was writing. And that year, I learned so much about writing, and my writing matured so much throughout that year. And then by the time I was 36, I think that was when I published it. So what happens is when you're when you're 35, like 35 to 36, it's as if Saturn is maturing rapidly that year. And then when you get to 36, you know, it kind of pops and you get the result of your Saturn. So when I was 35, I was developing my writing, getting to be a better writer, working on my stuff. 36, I believe that is when I published the book. And, um, and that one did well. The first one did really well. So um, these are great. These are really great. Um, I wasn't really even thinking about Rahu, the North Node. Rahu, um, at 42, you get your your Rahu maturity. So I have Rahu in, um, in my Vedic chart, Rahu in Scorpio in the second house. And, um, you know, it's interesting because this is kind of that, that midlife stuff with like Uranus opposition. But the second house, interesting in Vedic astrology, is given to speech a lot. So it's a house of speech. It's also a house of the family. It has a lot to do with your family, too. Interesting. Um, for the most part, the, the houses mean the same things, you know. Uh, but there's a few things that are, are, are a little different. I think really it's more like additions. It's more like, oh, I learned from Vedic astrology. The second house can have a lot to do with the family. It can have a lot to do with speech, speaking. Um, so anyway, what I noticed was that, like, um, for example, my, my 
Chris Brennan podcast, right? The astrology podcast. That was right at the beginning of my 42 year. Uh, I had just turned 42. And I have Rahu in the second house. So I was speaking about locational astrology, which is my gig, which allowed me to second house make money. I started to get clients, a lot more clients after that uh, podcast too. And I've been, been doing this a long time, but that was a really nice response from that podcast. And just generally throughout that year, I noticed that my confidence with what I had to say was just much stronger. I was just, it's just there, you know? So that's my Rahu maturing right there. So this is fun. And you get to go through your life and see what happens. Now, some of these may not be so great, right? Some of these planets may not be so great for you and those years may be challenging years but this is a, a really cool thing in vedic astrology that um i did want to point out to you guys because this is a bit of a, a poo poo platter today <laughs> you know we're trying a few different things here and i want to um, introduce you to some things so the question was 31 years 40 and 41 are missing well there's only certain um so currently 27 jessica okay i remember being 27 um my wife and i both have mars conjunct the south node Mars is not the best planet for either one of us. And I remember 27 was like, we had just moved here and bought a house. I live in Prescott, Arizona. So we've been here for 15 years, knock on wood. And um, uh, we had just moved here. And so we had this new mortgage and all this new stuff. And I remember it being one of the most challenging years in our relationship when we were 27 in that Mars year. And when it ended, that was, that was easier. Uh, how did they determine what age the planet matures at? I don't know the answer to that. I'm sorry. Um, Karen had also said 31 years, 40 and 41 are missing. There's only certain ones on there. You know, um, I see what you're saying here. Now, this piece of it where it's like Jupiter's 15 to 20 and all this, honestly, I don't use that in practice. It's not, I'm not saying it's wrong. I just don't ever think about it. So, yeah, I'm not quite sure about why some of those years are not there. Um, I actually don't even use that part at all. This is the part everybody uses that I'm aware of is this part. It's like which, you know, the key year, the peak of the effects. That's the thing that seems to be commonly used, okay? Um, back to the questions here. Yeah, so I don't know about that. <laughs> um, all right, so we also have Rahu and K2. Always a big one, right? The nodes of the moon. Maturation of K2, can you give a sentence or two? Well, I'm, I'm 43 now, <laughs> so um, I'll tell you, in, uh, you know, if I make it to this point here, right? Um, but K2, I, you know, you have to look at the chart. It's really specific to the chart. You know, all of my examples were pretty specific to my chart, right? Uh, all of my things. Saturn ruled my fifth house. That's why my writing got better. And then I published a book um, and so on. So K2, though, in general, is uh, the karaka, the indicator of spiritual enlightenment, spiritual liberation. So K2 has a very, very spiritual dimension to it. K2 is also very powerful for endings, completion. So it might be your, a very powerful turning point, very powerful completion of some type. Um, you know, it, it you, where you find it in the sidereal chart, and that house may be an area where you experience some limitation or you know diminishment or something like that. Um, but it's real profound stuff, and so it could really awaken some really beautiful things. K2 is really connected with a lot of, you know, mysticism and, and you know, even things like astrology. So it can really connect you with a lot of, uh, a lot of cool stuff like that, too. Um, so let's talk about Rahu and K2 a little bit, the nodes of the moon. So uh, one second there, maturation of K2. Okay, I'm 55. Am I done with these planets having much of effect? Well, Michelle, if 55, all of your planets are mature, right? Congratulations. <laughs> so um, it's just, you don't get those effects anymore, but you can look at other effects. You can look at your your dashas and all sorts of things. Sue says it really, really resonates. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, okay, back to Rahu and K2. So Rahu is the North Node. K2 is the South Node. And the mythology in Hinduism involves this sort of uh, serpent type being uh, a, a demon serpent in some versions of the mythology, I think, who is essentially trying to get this nectar of immortality. And at one point, the sun and moon realize that this serpent is trying to steal the nectar of immortality from the gods, and they tell Vishnu. And Vishnu takes the Sudarshan chakra, his discus, and <laughs> cuts, cuts the serpent in half. So we have a, a top and a bottom half at that point. We have Rahu, the, the head, and we have Ketu, which is kind of the, the tail, or the, or the butt, as I like to call it. And uh, it, it's, it's two parts at that point, and, and they're two halves of the same thing. Um, the mythology in, in Hindu astrology is so different than how we look at it in Western astrology. 
And I find the nodes really, really fascinating. I may, at one point I had intended to write a book on the nodes of the moon and I've got every book on the nodes of the moon you can imagine, I probably have it. Um, and it's been one of my passions for a long time to study the nodes of the moon. So I find, I find with the nodes that there are like three traditions with them. There's kind of the ancient Western tradition, which is fairly simple and true, right? The North node has a kind of a Jupiterian effect and expansive and opportunity and growth and so on. And the South node has more of a Saturn type effect, limitation, diminishment, you know, things like that, endings maybe. Um, now there's also uh, the Vedic side of it. And in, in Vedic astrology, there's mythology connected to these guys. So it's really rooted into something really cool. And it's hundreds of years old as well, thousands of years old, arguably. Um, and again, it's different. So I was talking to uh, Saul uh, Johansson the other day, and we were talking about the nodes of the moon. And um, I was saying that, that Rahu, the north node, is like a, a pit bull puppy or, or a pit bull puppy on crack. Okay. <laughs> The idea of the, the Rahu, the idea of Rahu, th that's the head. Think of the head of a, of a demonic serpent being trying to steal the nectar of immortality from the gods. That's Rahu. That's the part of you that's kind of crazy, right? That's the part of you that thinks there's something in this world that's going to fill you up and you need to put more stuff in your mouth and you got to drink more stuff and eat more stuff and devour more stuff and experience more fame and, and have more sex, right? Do all the things. That's Rahu. Um, and yet Rahu can be connected with fears. You know, like planets that are conjunct with Rahu, they're not necessarily well-placed because there's a really complicated psychology to Rahu. And, and a lot of fears get wrapped up in there. Some Vedic astrologers will say that uh, Rahu is like Saturn, which is odd if you're coming from the Western point of view because the South Node is supposed to be more like Saturn, right? And the North Node is more like Jupiter. Well, they look at Rahu as a as a malefic, you know? And that's not to say that they wouldn't recognize times where Rahu is powerful, where Rahu does you some good. Um, if Rahu is well-placed in the chart, it can produce some incredible success, for example. Um, but it's... Uh, it's a wild one, right? Now compare that with Ketu. If if Rahu is the pit bull puppy on crack, I, I saw like, then what's Ketu? And I was like, uh, the old guy who sits on the same bench every day in the park. It, it's it doesn't have the head. It's not really trying to eat anything. It's not trying to get something new. It it actually does. And Rahu, for that for that matter, and for that reason, can't really sit very well. So Rahu cycles are not times where people are likely to do the the deepest spiritual work. Um, because it's so active, right? You, you want to stay active in a Rahu cycle. You need to, because that's what Rahu is looking at. K2, though, is very mystical. K2, the south node of the moon, is, again, this, this indicator of potentially enlightenment, potentially spiritual liberation. So K2 um, does have kind of a, you know, a wild, intense side as well, though. It compares sometimes more to Saturn by the Vedic, I'm sorry, by, uh, to Mars by the Vedic astrologers. They'll say that K2 is like Mars. Um, I, I have also heard Vedic astrologers say that Rahu is like Uranus with these sort of sudden and unexpected events. Rahu is a, kind of a windstorm. It, it'll come in and shake things up. K2 is, uh, is weird, right? K2 is a strange one. And um, K2 will, um, K2, you know, conjoined with a planet has a lot of interesting, interesting effects. Um, I do think, by the way, that when people have really weird kind of superpowers, um, they you, you look to the nodes a lot of times to show those kind of those kind of people, right? So if if the X Men had uh, astrology charts, they would all have like major conjunctions with the nodes of the moon, because they are tied into this intense, powerful energy, and it's kind of not quite totally of this world in some ways, right? So you have someone like uh, Chris Brennan, who, if I'm not mistaken, has Mercury conjunct the South Node, right? And he knows stuff that's really old. Like, how does he know the stuff he knows, <laughs> right? It's like he came in here knowing a lot of this stuff somehow or, or just being able to really absorb it, reabsorb it really quickly. So it's connected to some old, old stuff, I would say. And sometimes the South Node will uh, spiritualize a part of someone's chart, make it more mystical, make it more strange and weird and unusual. 
Um, and so you have people with weird, like intuitive abilities and superpowers that uh, you'll see kind of connected with the South Node. Um, people will go through a, a K2 cycle in their lives and they might go through seven years of K2. And that is a seven year twilight zone in your life, typically. It's a weird time. And a lot of times, you know, K2, the South Node has the sense of ending and completing things. So you'll get to the end of that K2 cycle and find that you're in a very different place than you started. And you'll even see things like people will go into it with a, a desire. They'll have this egoic, you know, of the ego desire. And they may want something. They go into that cycle and they pursue it. And by the end of it, K2 is saying, puts a wall in front of it. It says, okay, you tried that thing. It's over. Often that's like the second half or the latter half of uh, a K2 cycle. That's where you get that kind of effect. Um, K2 cycles can be worked with. You can go through a K2 dasha and um, embrace the altruism and the, the selflessness and the spirituality. Maybe um, like uh, my friend uh, Sam Gepi, he went through his K2 cycle not that long ago. He's in Venus now. But uh, any of you guys who know Sam, uh, when he went into K2, he became really, really like uh, locked in on his astrology. He started teaching a lot of classes. He was real laser focused. Um, and he just embraced you know, that. So if, you, if you're an astrologer, a K2 cycle is often pretty good because it might mean that you get really like uh, deep into your astrology. So it's a good time. A K2 cycle will often be a good time for people to do a lot of spiritual practice and study things like astrology and kind of focus more on the spiritual side of life. If you tend to be attached more to your, your ego and, and those sort of desires, you know, then it's a little bit of a wilder ride. In any case, it tends to be a, um, a bit of a roller coaster. So um, Deidre was saying it makes sense regarding K2 cycle. Uh, question, when you say a K2 cycle, are you referring to? Boo, boo, boo. Uh, questions are coming in too fast. Referring to a K2 maturation period or a transit to natal K2. I was more so referring to the K2 dasha, right? So let me show you guys also the dashas. I, I've, I've touched on Rahu and K2 a little bit. I think we'll, we'll probably cycle back to that. Um, but this, this again, this, this talk is a little bit of a lot of things. When is the K2 seven-year cycle? When does it take place? So that's a great question uh, from Anita. Thank you. Um, Gauri says, I have Rahu conjunct Saturn and Jupiter all in Leo Singh in fifth, I'm, I'm in your 36th, 39th year, sorry. All right, so let's see, when does it take place? So here's how the, the, the dashas work. It's kind of interesting. For, for the dashas to, uh, to run the full cycle of the Vedic dashas, you ha would have to live to be 120. So if you live to be 120, you will go through every single piece of the Vim Shotri dashas. It's a 120 year thing. Everyone is born into a certain spot within that 120 years. So we could lay out the 120 years like on paper, right? And you're dropping in here. You're dropping in in the middle of Saturn or the beginning of Saturn or the end of Saturn. Um, you know, I was born into a Rahu cycle. Rahu is, again, kind of a wild energy, right? It's in my second house of family. So I was born into a Rahu cycle. You know, my father had killed himself when I was, by the time I was about 13 months old. You know, my grandfather died a year after that. So obviously there was a tumultuous energy in the family, you know, at that time. And, um, you know, then you go from there. So then I had a lot of Jupiter. And um, this is this is, uh, this is actually Kelly Lee Phipps right here, his chart. I wanted to show you something here because it, it illustrates how important it is to study the placement of the chart in the dasha cycles. Let me take one more step back. If there is one thing I would recommend about Vedic astrology, and the, I think the main reason I stuck with it for so long, uh, and I'm still doing it, is because the Vedic dashas are so powerful. And I, as I said in the description of the talk, I believe this is by far the most powerful life cycle, time period sort of thing we have in astrology. Um, I think what is going on in Hellenistic astrology is incredible, right? We're rediscovering these time lords that are so powerful. There are Vedic time lord systems that are more like uh, zodiacal releasing, which are sign-based. Um, so, for example, uh, Jaimini is a system of Vedic astrology. So the Jaimini uh, Chara Dasha system well, is based on the signs. So it's like, oh, I'm in my Aries period, right? The Vimshotri Dashas are different. They're amazing. And um, they're they're planetary. So, for example, here here is Kelly Lee Phipps. So Kelly was um, many of you know him. Um, he was a, a great friend of mine. I would say he was a brother of mine and great astrologer and and just a wonderful guy. 
So he passed away some years back. And he's born with his moon here in uh, Mrigashira, near the beginning of it. You can see, if you know Vedic astrology, near the beginning of the Nakshatra Mrigashira, which is ruled by Mars. So he started life in the Mars um, cycle, Mars Dasha. And I know he had brothers growing up. I know that, I, mean, I don't know a whole lot about specifics on his early life, but I'm just thinking about the Mars element of it, right? Um, brothers, he, um, let's see, this, this is just the early part of his life, first four years. Uh, there's probably some, some family stuff going on there too. Um, but anyway, we won't, we won't go into that. So anyway, he's born into Mars and, uh, and then that cycle runs and Mars always has the same, you know, the same length. And then Rahu always has the same length and Jupiter always has the same length. Um, Rahu, you're going to run for 18 years when you get to Rahu. That's, that's the way it goes. When you get to Jupiter, it's going to be 16 years. When you get to Saturn, it's 19 years. Uh, we get to Mercury, 17. K2 is 7. Venus is 20. So the longest cycle is actually Venus. The sun is 6 years. Actually, the shortest cycle is the sun. Uh, the moon is 10 years. And then we have Mars at seven years. So those, you know, if I if I do I do a lot of location work. Most of my work is um, helping people figure out where they want to live. And I will often not even take a look at their transits. Uh, if I'm doing just a location reading, I'm just focused on here's what it's like to live in San Francisco. Here's what it's like to live in New York. You know, that I can just analyze by itself. But if I want to look at one timing piece, this is what I look at. Now keep in mind, I started with Western astrology. I'm not necessarily predisposed to think that this is better. I use it because I think it's better. I really do. I really think this is, it's it's not that this, this is all I want to have either. I love my secondary progressions and I love all of my Western transits and the solar arcs. I love all of it, you know, but if I have to look at one thing and I want an overview of where the person is at in their life, I look at this. This tells me a lot. So what I want to show you here, and I'll show you Kelly's chart and I'll show you my chart. Because both, both he and I went into a Saturn Dasha. Um, and the results were, uh, they were very, very different. So, and I've actually got, I've, I, did a, I did some research here with Kelly and I pulled up some stuff to get the dates right. And it's, it's pretty cool. Some of the stuff that's still on the web for him, like an old blog and, you know, some things like that. So before I get into this example, of his, his Saturn Dasha, um, I want to actually just check one more time to make sure there's no... No questions I want to get to. Um, all right, so so I hope I answered your question about, about when does that seven-year K2 cycle take place. It depends. You could go through your whole life. You could live to be 100 or 110 for that matter and never even run the K2 Dasha, right? Because it's only seven years out of the 120. So that's cool, Deborah. <laughs> um, all right. So let's, let's, look at, let's look at this. Let's look at this. So Kelly goes into his Saturn Dasha June 6th, 2010. Now, this is using um, a couple things. It's using the typical calculation for the length of a year, just the astronomical length of that. And um, it's using the Lahiri Ayanamsha. What is an Ayanamsha? Well, the Ayanamsha refers to what's the separation between the tropical and sidereal zodiac. Currently, it's about 24 degrees. Uh, over time, that changes, right? Um, you know, eventually if, if we don't, you know, blow up the planet, uh, we could get to a point where, um, they're exactly 30 degrees off, you know, and like, well, you have the moon in Taurus in tropical. Guess what? It's definitely in Aries and in, in, in uh, sidereal, right? Eventually that, that would happen. Um, so, okay. So there's different ways to time this. And I'm, that's a bit of bad news for you because it would be great if this was just easy, now, this is the one most people use. If you want to keep it simple, you can use this. It's, it's, uh, it, I do like this one. It's Lahiri Ayanamsha. Um, by the way, the Lahiri Ayanamsha, the way it orients the zodiac, because what what, anytime you have an Ayanamsha, what you have to do is you have to say, okay, well, what starry reference point do we pin the zodiac to, right? So what Lahiri says is it takes uh, Chitra. That's the Vedic name for the Western, what we call in the West, Spica. Okay, Spica is widely regarded as the most auspicious star, or at least one of the most auspicious stars. So uh, also considered auspicious over in India. So that's nice. And what they say with the Lahiri Ayanamsha is that um, Chitra, Spica, is at the very, 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 very end of Virgo. 
right? So that's 29, 59, 59 Virgo. And from there, boom, you know, you put your pin right there, you've got a Zodiac, just draw a circle around it, 360 degrees, you're good to go. That's what the Lahiri Ayanamsha does. By the way, the, the Lahiri Ayanamsha is the official Ayanamsha of, uh, of, the, of the Indian government. The government of India has said, let's just say it's Lahiri, <laughs> right? Let's try to solve this Tower of Babel sort of thing uh, and make it that. So that's pretty interesting, right? Um, so we have, we have this, okay? And this is the most common uh, timing method. So if I pull, you know, 10 Vedic astrologers out of the hat in the West, uh, probably at least seven or eight of them are going to be doing this. Maybe even 10 of them. They're going to be pointing at this, this time frame. Probably not all 10 of them. Um, now, I have found another one that I think actually works kind of a little better. Uh, and originally this came from Ernst Wilhelm. Um, and so when I look at this one, and here's the thing, Ernst Wilhelm doesn't even use this particular method anymore, but when he did use it, and I learned it through Sam Gepi, um, I found this one made, this one just worked better than the one that everybody else was using. And I thought they were really onto something. You'll notice in this one, it says that Kelly's Saturn Dasha started uh, July 11th, 2009. So this one, however, and I'm using the, the calculations I initially got through Sam from Ernst. This one, however, is usually about three to four months off in my experience. And usually you go back three or four months. So if I go back three to four months from July, I'm going to what, March or April of 2009. So here's how I actually look at this. And, you know, a lot of Vedic astrologers keep it simple. And they'll just say, oh, your Saturn Dasha starts uh, June 6th, 2010. However, and I'll tell you this in practice, and here, there's really kind of a really nice shorthand with this, or shortcut, really. If you go back about a year and a half, you, you'll, you'll generally be in the ballpark. The older someone gets, the further back you have to go. Um, the younger they are, the, you don't have to go back quite as far. So a younger person, you might go back a year. Someone who's, who's quite a bit older, you might go back two years. So when I see Saturn, his Saturn Dasha starting June 6, 2010, Right off the bat, I'm going, okay, 2009 is probably when he started his Saturn Dasha. Just, and I, I don't have to get like crazy specific on the dates at that point because I just know there's this massive, massive sea change in his life at that point. So what happened for Kelly around that time? I'm going to check the questions first. All right, good. So check this out, guys. Astrologer Kelly Lee Phipps on Wife Swaps Night. This is actually a blog from Chris, um, Horoscopic Astrology blog. April 24th, 2009. Remember this one? July 2009, go back three or four months. Boom, April. So he's on wife swap. So Kelly was on wife swap. Kelly was obviously an astrologer. Um, and that was obviously quite a bit of fame. Let's look at, uh, let's look at his Saturn for a second. So... Here's Kelly's chart. Now, this is a South Indian style chart, and I'm sure a lot of you are looking at this and scratching your heads. Okay, but it's pretty simple, right? This line here shows his sidereal rising, which is Scorpio. So this is the first house. Sag is the second house. Capricorn's the third house, and so on and so forth. So Saturn rules his third house, Capricorn. Saturn rules his fourth house, uh, Aquarius. So... You know, honestly, I don't I don't think I would have predicted him being on wife swap, right? But it's kind of funny. He he literally third and fourth house, right? He, sw he homes. He literally had to swap homes, right? Someone else's wife came and lived with him for two weeks. <laughs> His wife went and lived with another dude for a week or two. I forget how long it was. And it's I guess that's kind of it's kind of third house, right? The the, the swapping wives bit. Um, and maybe something that's uh, kind of very descriptive here: Saturn and Aries which is definitely considered the debilitation sign, you know, for Saturn in Vedic astrology, just, just as it is in the West. The, the Vedic astrologers consider the exaltations and falls very importantly, very powerfully. Um, in fact, I think maybe they're even more powerful in sidereal astrology because it's just so basic and it's so big and it's so important. So if I see Saturn in Aries, okay, well, we got to be careful here, right? I mean, this is, there's going to be some tough times. There's going to be some intensity. We can say that for sure. Now, it's in the sixth house. What is the sixth house? Well, for one, it's the twelfth house from the seventh house. So it's the loss of the seventh house. It's like losing your wife. <laughs> it's like losing your partner, which unfortunately did actually happen because of being on this show. And apparently it's not that uncommon for couples to get divorced after they've been on wife swap is what I was told. 
Saturn's in the sixth house in its sign of fall. So we're thinking, oh, not the greatest relationship period probably for Kelly. And here's a very interesting thing. though. So the planets don't make a lot of aspects in Vedic astrology, but they make a small number. And one of them that Saturn makes is the sort of backwards square, right? Go, you know, three signs back, 22 Capricorn. What is it 22 Capricorn? His sun is at 22 Capricorn in Vedic astrology, right? He's an Aquarius, everybody knows in Western astrology, but Vedic astrology, he was the Capricorn sun. The sun rules his 10th house. Was he famous at the time? Yes, not in the best way, right? Because um, he didn't necessarily come across all that well on that show, unfortunately. And I think he was really trying to help like the show because they're the show probably wants you to play up being really dramatic and having conflicts with your, you know, pseudo wife. And so he did, you know, he was a nice guy. He wanted everybody to, you know, do well here, I think. So he kind of made himself, you know, look silly sometimes. And um, he didn't, you know, it wasn't a great moment, like in terms of how he ultimately came across in that show, which again, is really sad because he was probably just trying to help them have a good show or whatever. Um, so, you know, first of all, that was a really significant event, right? So what this set into motion was a lot of problems. Um, and so... Kelly decided to move back to Boulder. His wife was with him in Asheville, uh, North Carolina. And he, I guess, thought she would come. He needed to go. He needed to get back to Boulder. He was, he was had, a, you know, an itch in him. Um, but over that year, she didn't come. And they got, they split up. So this was the start of his Saturn Dasha, right? In, in a super hard aspect to the Lord of his 10th house, about all about sort of not getting along with your spouse and it literally leads to a divorce all right so let's go to this next date june 6th 2010 this one's also really this one's really exact now now the nice thing about the lahiri Inamsha and, and that calculation is that those dates are are exact like they work really really well you go back to his uh traveling magi.blogspot.com he still has this great blog up here um what does he decide to do? You know, he had been planning it before this, but two weeks after he started his Saturn Dasha, he got on a bike in Boulder and decided he was going to ride it all the way to the West Coast. And he did. And he met up with uh, his kid at one point, got on his bike. They rode together. They they went up to, I think they made it to Canada. They definitely made it to like uh, places like Washington, Oregon, and California, if I'm not mistaken. Um, when he was in California in Davis, he was hit uh, on a bike he was hit by a car so he um had that happen so this is pretty this is crazy right this is amazing right who would get on a bike i mean he, he how old was he at the time i mean he was 39 ish right something like that i think he was 39 yeah so he decides i'm gonna bike all the way across the country he used to be a, a linebacker for the colorado buffaloes in college you know very very mars guy now, look at this chart, by the way. Mars and Scorpio in the first house. In Vedic astrology, they have these things called Mahapurusha yogas. Like, you'll be a great person or great representative of a planetary archetype. These are really cool. If you have a planet in its own sign, like Mars and Scorpio, or in its exaltation sign, and it's in the first house, the seventh house, the fourth house, or the tenth house. And so he is a great Mars. Was he? Of course. Big, strong guy, right? Linebacker, rode his bike across the country, uh, really into science. Mars, I learned from Vedic astrology, Mars has a lot to do with science, being very logical, very grounded. Um, and so, yeah, there's Kelly, right? And Mars, Jupiter conjunct. Uh, Neptune, you can see, is in there too. So when his Saturn Dasha starts the second time, as I would say it, like to me, it's coming in in two waves here, right? So the first wave, wife swap, divorce at it moved to boulder divorce pretty big stuff right second time ride your bike across the country with your kid uh get in an accident you know eventually come home and what do we see here saturn in aries in the sixth house right think about you know i mean th there is a martial element i think to the sixth house and I, I get this somewhat from vedic astrology it's like overcoming obstacles it's dealing with the stress and it's it's competition and Mars and uh, sorry, Saturn in, in Aries is really obviously has a lot of energy associated with it as well. Um, anyway, we fast forward just a little bit more. I'm hearing a little bit of noise. Let me just double check that everything's kosher here. 
Okay, everything was kosher for now. Um, all right, a little bit further. So um, Kelly did pass away on March 25th, 2014. So he made it, um, he made it, you know, four or five years into his uh, Saturn cycle before he ultimately passed away. It was in the fall of 2013 when uh, he realized he had a brain tumor, very aggressive, uh, super advanced brain tumor. And I think within about six months, yeah, he was, uh, you know, he wasn't here with us anymore. You can see this, by the way, Saturn in the sixth house in Aries, right? Uh, in a perfect, perfect square to his son. And the son, I, as I've learned, is not only connected with things like the back and the heart, it is also connected with the brain. And this is a, this is a, um, I heard, I heard unmuted. That's all right. Um, so anyway, that, that was an example of the Saturn Dasha. Okay. So that was Kelly Saturn Dasha, all those things. Pretty dramatic, right? So Here's me starting a Saturn Dasha. Go back to 2003. So remember that rule of thumb. You subtract about a year, year and a half. So if I subtract about a year from October 12, 2003, eh, we'll, go, we'll go somewhere around October 2002, maybe in the summer of 2002. Well, what was I doing in the summer of 2002? We were scoping out a house to buy a house. We visited here, Prescott, Arizona. By the fall, we had bought our first house. So what is Saturn doing in my chart? Well, Saturn rules my fourth house real estate what does it also do aspects my fourth house real estate this is capricorn this is saturn therefore saturn is aspecting and strengthening its own sign uh, its own house capricorn so very clearly there's a very fourth house element to this saturn is also very much connected with real estate if you're not aware of that saturn is probably the strongest significator for real estate i also get that from vedic astrology i've seen that time and time again saturn also rules my fifth house uh, I've had three kids during my Saturn cycle. I've written two novels. I've done well. Uh, I've played a lot of games. I've had a lot of fun. Um, you know, it, it's been a lot of fifth house in my life. Saturn is a pretty good place, uh, is in a pretty good place in my Vedic chart. Um, I noticed actually Adam had this too at the very beginning of Cancer, which is actually um, that little pada, that little first like three degrees and 20 minutes of Cancer is called a, I believe it's a Pushkara. Navamsha, it's one of the more auspicious ones. So that gives it a little luck. Um, and Saturn is, is in the sign of my moon. Where's my moon? It's in the ninth house. It's exchanging signs with Mercury, which is in the 10th house. We have a Mercury in Gemini in the ninth, Mercury, uh, sorry, moon in Gemini in the ninth, Mercury in Cancer in the 10th. So it's connected to this ninth and 10th Lord, a mutual reception or Parivartana Yoga. Um, so Saturn's connected to the Lord of the 11th, the Lord of the ninth, the Lord of the 10th. Basically, so I have a Knock on wood, a pretty good Saturn, right? And I, I organized the blast during this this whole period as well. And I, I, you know, taught a little bit at schools and done volunteerism with kids. So um, Saturn, my Saturn cycle, for the most part, we've been real comfortable. And it rules my fourth house. That's a house of being comfortable, being happy, you know, having having some nice stuff around you or whatever. So this was my Saturn Dasha. And I wanted to illustrate this to show you the difference between two different Saturn Dashas, right? You might see in your chart, oh, I'm coming into a Saturn Dasha, or my client is coming into a Saturn Dasha, or my partner, or my mom, or whoever. I this, this really should drive home the point, right? That you have to look at the chart. You have to analyze how is Saturn in that chart. If it's doing well, you know, that that could be a really nice cycle for you. Um, you, you go from Jupiter to Saturn. So anytime you go into a Saturn cycle, you're coming out of Jupiter and quite possibly 16 years of Jupiter. And a lot of times what happens, and especially if you have not so good a Jupiter, but a better Saturn is by the end of 16 years of Jupiter. And I think we can actually kind of see this a little bit in Kelly's chart too. Cause remember, you know, Kelly was in Jupiter before that. Now Kelly actually has a pretty great Jupiter from a, you know, basically from a sidereal Vedic point of view, it, it rules his fifth house and his second house. So it's a great planet for making money. It's in his first house. Jupiter has what's called Digbala or directional strength in the first house. This is why he was such a, a tremendous teacher and why he had uh, such a following as a teacher. This was actually one of the more interesting things I learned about um, this, this idea of Digbala, that each planet has an angle where it's really strong and it really can deliver its goods and it can really help that angle to deliver its goods. So Jupiter and Mercury are the two that when they're on the ascendant, they have Digbala, they have directional strength. 
So if you see people with Jupiter rising or Jupiter near the ascendant, even like maybe within 60 degrees of the ascendant, um, they have a strong Jupiter in Vedic astrology in terms of directional strength. And these people, for example, are more likely or, or more easily they attract uh, students to themselves, right? They can often be teachers because they're just natural Jupiterians. Well, Kelly was like that, very natural Jupiterian. Um, his Jupiter is with Mars. Mars rules the first house. This is a Raja Yoga. Um, the yogas are great in Vedic astrology. It's combinations. And these combinations create these really neat, unique stories. Well, this is a really generic one, Raja Yoga. It's just the Lord of the first with the Lord of the fifth. In Vedic astrology, the first house, the fifth house, and the ninth house are the trikona houses. And those are the most auspicious. Imagine this just flow of grace, right? And these, we would maybe call them fire houses in the West, first, fifth, ninth. But these are these houses connected with the most auspiciousness generally in Vedic astrology. Dharma. These are the houses of Dharma, finding some positive right livelihood, you know, based off of kind of more of your good karma. <laughs> and so Jupiter and Mars, first and fifth, in his first, in a sign ruled by Mars. What's opposite to that? Moon and Taurus in the seventh house. So Kelly had a pretty, you know, pretty great Jupiter cycle. Um, however, by the end of it, he did his movie, The Return of the Magi, the documentary, which I appeared in, lots of lots of people appeared in that. And he debuted it at, uh, at UAC um, in Denver, and that was 2008. So this was just before his Saturn cycle started. Now, you could argue, hey, maybe his Saturn cycle started from some other calculation method in 2008. And you know what? That, that could be true, right? Because this was also a hard event for him. He had a hard time, by the way, that was, okay, sorry, um, 2008, well, it's still Jupiter. So was that Jupiter or was that Saturn? Well, I, I would say it was Jupiter, but Saturn's coming in. So there is starting to be some overlap. Um, and sometimes at the end of a Jupiter cycle, you, you're, you know, you're big. And so he was big. He put out this incredible documentary where he interviewed, you know, Rob Hand and Stephen Force and all the big names at the time. And, um, you know, did, did a service for the community in that way. But by the end of that Jupiter cycle, he was maybe a little bit too Jupiterian. So there, there wasn't enough editing. There wasn't, you know, good enough quality sound. The acting sequences weren't so good. So it was kind of a big mess with these amazing interviews also. And I think that still that those interviews will be historical and wonderful for the future, future generations. Um, but maybe that's an example of like Jupiter getting a little out of hand. So sometimes at the end of a Jupiter cycle, you get a little bit, I'm not going to say this about Kelly, but for other people, they might be kind of bloviating a little too much at that point, right? They're just so used to being Jupiterian for 16 years. I'm going to spout off about whatever. And it's, they need a little Saturn, right? They need to kind of tighten that belt a little bit and, and get a little more discipline and structure in their lives. So sometimes people go from Jupiter to Saturn and it's the worst thing ever. And sometimes they go from Jupiter to Saturn and it's the best thing ever. Um, I'm really driving home that point that you can't generalize too much. Now you can pull up these cycles and I hope you will. And I hope you'll get curious about them because there's a whole lot to learn here. I do feel like Morpheus here offering you the blue and the red pill. So, you know, if you take the red pill, it is what it is. Um, but this stuff is is as solid as it gets, really, in astrology, I think. And you, one thing you can always be certain about, and it's always you can always be certain with your clients. Hey, look, like I have a client. Oh, you just went into a Mercury Dasha. You could just ask them, what's been going on since last year? Oh, well, I've gone back to school and I'm traveling to Europe and I'm blah, 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 right? Okay, now you, you have an idea what's going on with their Mercury cycle. <laughs> That's my secret, uh, you know, my secret weapon there. Ask them. Oh, you've been in a Venus cycle for three years. You know, what, what did you notice starting in the summer of, you know, 2015? They will tell you things. And generally the way the cycle starts, not exclusively, right? Not, not entirely, but it will be generally the way the cycle goes, generally. Now, there may be exceptions to that. Be careful. But uh, you've been in Venus for five years and it's been nothing but relationship drama. Okay, you got 15 years to go, right? You got to figure out how to talk about that. Um. But these cycles are big, man. They're so big. They're so powerful. I love, I love, by the way, that they call the, the planets in Vedic astrology, they call them grahas. A graha is something that seizes you. When you go into a new cycle, a new Vedic dasha, that energy seizes you, okay? My wife went into a Mars dasha some years back. She became very Martian all of a sudden. <laughs> So I, I now counsel couples on this when one of them goes into a Mars cycle and the other one doesn't. 
right? You just get possessed by that energy. It really, it really does kind of take over you. You know, I'm still near the end of my Saturn cycle, right? So I'm still, okay, I'm, I'm a dad, I'm doing my work, I'm playing my games and doing my stuff. Like, you know, that's kind of been this 19 years. Um, and I'm going into a Mercury Dasha in a few years. I'm like, hmm, what is that going to be, right? Certainly curious about it. So with all of your clients, it's worth looking at this and it's worth seeing, huh, you're going into a moon cycle in two years. Hmm. Let's look at your sidereal chart. Now, here's where you, you should study Vedic astrology to know how to interpret these things. You can't just learn it from me today. Obviously, we don't have enough time. Um, but let's say you see moon in cancer in the ninth house and it's got a trine from Jupiter and they're going into a moon cycle. Now, even then, you still want to learn some more. Um, but generally speaking, that would be a pretty fantastic moon cycle. Lore of the ninth, sitting in the ninth in its own sign aspected by Jupiter. If, if, if the moon, like in this chart here, if the moon is in Cancer in the ninth and it's aspected by Jupiter, well, Jupiter is going to be either in Pisces or, or Scorpio. It's going to be the Lord of the fifth house. That makes it auspicious for the chart. The Lord of the fifth house carries a lot of good karma, so to speak. It's going to aspect the moon. It's going to benefit the moon. You know, so you can, you can really see these things. And if you do a little bit of looking, you're going to be blown away. But you, what you won't know how to do is how to interpret all of it until you learn the, the, the system of Vedic astrology. I don't think it's that hard, honestly. Those are famous last words. It, it's not that hard to get the basics, I should say, right? It's not that hard to learn basics of interpretation. The subtlety of the real mastery of it is a lifetime, you know, sort of pursuit. Um, but the basics, I think you can learn. Um, I am, I ha had actually put out to teach a, a class. Uh, here's my website real quick, by the way, it's astrology for the soul.com and oh, interesting. This isn't lining up right. New website. Um, anyway, there's some stuff on here. You go to the latest and you get like kind of what's going on and there's classes and stuff. Um, I had recently announced I was going to teach a, uh, intermediate, um, to advanced class called holistic astrology, just kind of a real general, Hey, what do you guys want to learn? Let's do it, you know, um, real flexible. But if there's enough interest in Vedic astrology for Western astrologers, I'm going to change this. And basically, if I get enough people tonight that are interested, I'll change this to Vedic astrology for Western astrologers. I had tried to teach that earlier this year, but I didn't get enough people. It's probably because I'm getting back in the swing of things. I just sent out my newsletters recently for the first time in years, basically. So I'm just kind of getting myself back out there. So um, I, you know, I'd love to do some teaching in astrology. Um, I'm not going to force anything. I do really consistent work with clients. I'm very happy with that. Um, but, you know, part of me would like to teach too. I have Jupiter on my ascendant right now. So it seems like a good time to do it. So if there's people who want to take a class, I don't teach a lot. Um, I haven't taught in a long, long time. But if there's people who want to study, I think I can hopefully t put a good class together here. So let me know if you're interested either in this class or the Vedic class. Um, I'm going to go check out some questions because I know we've been talking for a while and uh, I'm sure there's some great questions here. Okay, so do you look at dignities through sidereal? Yes. And tropical zodiacs? Yes. Or do you have a preference? Um, absolutely, 100% both. So recently, uh, I'm on this uh, Facebook group for like astrocartography, and um, and someone had said, hey, I, I'm here on my Jupiter midheaven line, and I've had a terrible career, I've not had any work, I've only recently become a teacher. And it was a Jupiter in Aquarius in tropical astrology. So... I look at it and right off the bat, I'm like, okay, yeah, that's Jupiter and Capricorn in sidereal. Like that's, that, he had Jupiter and Capricorn in sidereal. So why would Jupiter and Capricorn at the midheaven necessarily be great for someone's career? It's not. It might be in some cases, depending on the aspects and some things like that. But, um, you know, it wasn't. And so, yes, you've got to look at the dignities both ways. And I think that's one of the big things that I cringe about when other people do locational astrology and they're only using one zodiac. You might have Venus in Libra, right, in, in Western astrology, but then you have Venus in Virgo in Vedic astrology. It's a whole different story. You have to see both sides of that. You have to, or else you're going to give people terrible advice, and you don't want that, <laughs> right? So um, let's see. Let's go back to the questions here. Kelly's classes in Asheville were always packed. He was amazing. He could just walk into a room and go, hey, come here. I want to teach you some astrology, and everybody just gather around. I mean, I, just, I love that guy. Um, all right, so when the questions come in, uh, the chat goes up. So I have to read from the bottom. Can you use the dashas against a tropical chart? That is a very interesting and controversial question. Um, Ernst Wilhelm will tell you that you can. He's a modern guy.
guy. He, I think he's a really brilliant guy. He is very much on the fringe with that opinion, but other people are starting to share it. Um, I would advise not to read in that way. I would advise to read this, uh, the Dasha's through the sidereal zodiac and the Vedic chart and all the ways that the Vedic astrologers interpret that chart. And that's certainly, you know, more traditional, more conventional. There's a lot of history to that. Keep in mind with Vedic astrology, I mean, not only is there a great oral tradition here, right? But there's also a spiritual tradition here. I think it's one of the reasons why the Vedic astrology works so well and why these cycles are so powerful because the people who have been practicing this they do things like chant Om Gam Ganapati Ye Namaha, or actually they chant to the planets, or they chant to, you know, they have their own mantra, right? But there's, there's a, a spirituality infused into the system, and I think it's one of the reasons why it is so auspicious, and why it is so protected, and why it does work. Uh, question from Kendall, if a person's in a Saturn Dasha, do transits from Saturn and to the natal Saturn have more importance or weight during that time? I would say yes. I would say yes. I'm in the fifth year of my Jupiter cycle, in the middle of which Rahu Mahadasha ended. Um... And running 39 a.m., finishing off Saturn peak period with that Sun Saturn Rahu conjunction. Oh, boy, it's a lot of stuff. I'm sorry, there's too many details. You've lost me. It's 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 a it's an overview talk. I apologize. We can always talk later. Um, are the classes recorded? I'm on Atlantic time plus four hours. Uh, yes, I am on Pacific time. I think I was going to schedule the class for um, what was it like 6:30 my time? That's like 10:30. Yeah. So uh, yes, these would be recorded. Uh, I would use you know um, go to meeting and record that. North South node combined period. What does that mean, Moses? By Adam. You know, it's I don't have a, a great answer, but it's obviously it's it's both halves, right? So there's a, an obvious karmic moment there. Um, the south node will tend to bring more of a sense of the ending, right? And the completion and the spirituality. But it's a in a way, it's a, it's kind of a wild card time in a way, because they're both such powerful energies. I'd certainly want to read the chart, you know, try to get a sense of what does that north node and that south node look like. Um Speaking of the dashas real quick, since we still have a little time, let's I wanted to show you guys something that is absolutely stunning. Who started a Jupiter dasha on November 14th, 2016? Donald Trump. Donald Trump was in Rahu for 18 years precisely up until the moment of his election. He was elected what a week before his Jupiter Dasha started. So here's a guy for 18 years who was seized by Rahu. Now this guy has quite a chart. He has something called uh, Kala Sarpa Yoga, the serpent of time. And the way that basically works, we're not looking at Uranus because we're doing Vedic stuff. Um, he basically has all the planets, you know, between the nodes on one side. It's pretty much what's going on there. Um, and so... <laughs> I actually found something amazing today as I was getting ready for this talk. And I think I want to read it to you because I decided that um, Linda Johnson wrote about Kala Sarpa Yoga and Donald Trump uh, for this book that was published in 1997, Hindu Astrology Lessons. Lots of different um, kind of essays, articles from different people. So Linda Johnson, who I would highly recommend. She's, she's pretty great. <laughs> this is going to be perhaps funny for some of you. Kala Sarpa Yoga, caught in the karmic axis. The much-dreaded Kala Sarpa Yoga reveals a soul trapped within the karmic axis. The sobering planetary configuration is generally understood to occur when all the classic planets, sidereal sun through Saturn, fall between the, moon, the moon's nodes. It signals a lifetime of more than usual karmic significance, a make-or-break life in the cycle of a soul's incarnations. Kala Sarpa Yoga, the serpent of time, is considered highly inauspicious. It is sometimes associated with physical or moral deformity, hmm, moral deformity, severe difficulties, reversals of fortune, and betrayal. Perhaps its most common association is with a quick, sudden rise in life, followed by a disastrous fall. When the planets lie between Rahu and Ketu, great material success. Okay, da, 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 I'm going to skip that. Pr probably the most spectacular, well, do they lie between Rahu and Ketu? They're more like between K2 and Rahu here. Um, he says a serious spiritual crisis. She says a serious spiritual crisis is power, possible for that. Anyway, she continues, probably the most spectacular recent example of a Kala Sarpa yoga in action is Donald Trump. This is 1997 is when this book was published. This yoga was fully activated in Trump's chart because he was born so near a lunar eclipse, the nodes palpably signaling their power. In Trump's natal chart, Rahu lies a bare two degrees from his sun, 
and Ketu a scant fraction of a degree from his moon, which has fallen in the inauspicious nakshatra of Jyeshta. As Trump entered his sun dasha, his major planetary cycle, in mid-1976, he began his meteor meteoric rise in the real estate business. Notice his natal sun and Rahu lie in the 11th house of gains and profits. She's actually using a different chart. There's two different times for Donald Trump, right? This is the one that I think is correct. And a lot of people had the one before that would have given him a cancer rising, actually, in Vedic astrology. But anyway, 10th house would work here, too. Um, by the middle of his doctor, he's a self-made billionaire. That, that does also sound like the 11th house. But um, a world-renowned celebrity. However, the Kala Sarpa Yoga played itself out played itself out by the conclusion of the moon cycle in July 92. By that time, his vast financial empire had collapsed, leaving him $900 million in debt. Debilitated moon K2 in the fifth house of financial speculation, which is in the fourth house in this version of the chart, um, which is the gives him a Leo rising in Vedic astrology, um, gives him major losses and terrible mental anguish, right? So she goes on and does some pretty, pretty incredible stuff here. Um, she talks about how he's in a K2 bukti in his moon dasha. Three of his top executives were killed in a helicopter crash. I didn't know about this. Trump himself had originally been scheduled to be on that flight. The shock of this brush with death precipitated Trump's break with his wife, Ivana, a few months later as he struggled with deep depression and reevaluated his course in life. Never underestimate the impact of powerfully placed nodes. Um, I thought this was interesting. What do you say to a client when you see this configuration? First, before you sound the alarm, remember to read the yoga against the chart as a whole. Um... Secondly, never ever frighten your client. When clients consult you, even if their attitude seems nonchalant, a part of their subconscious is relating to you as an oracle, a voice through which the cosmos itself is speaking to them. It sometimes horrifies me how, how vividly many people recall a negative remark an astrologer thoughtlessly made to them years previously. As Vedic astrologers, we are literally karmic counselors. Our job is to help direct our clients to the most auspicious fulfillment of their destinies possible through their dedicated and inspired self-effort not to a sense of fatalism and futility. She's great. This is, uh, well, that's not her, but that was her article in there, Linda Johnson. Um, I have her book here, A Thousand Suns. I think it's one of the really nice introductions to Vedic astrology. I highly recommend it. Um, books like Astrology for the Seers are, are good general introductions. Light on Life by Heart Defoe is a really good, solid book. He's very militant. He's very kind of Martian about things. It's really good, too. Yeah, that's a great book. Um, so many good good books out there. Anyway, Trump is uh, he's a trip here, and um, <clears throat> boy, there's a lot we could say about him. Um, I remember when last August, when um, oh yeah, Saturn was on his moon, wasn't it? Uh, and uh, Charlottesville happened, and that was his moon in Scorpio, right? Fallen moon with K2 in Scorpio. We can say a lot about him, but I did want to show you, because this is just absurd, right? Rahu for 18 years. So Rahu, remember, that's the pit bull puppy on crack, right? <laughs> so he, he's going after everything that he thinks is going to fill him up, and you know, we'll do The Apprentice, and we'll do the real estate, and we'll have, you know, all these sex with all these porn stars, and we'll, you know, I mean, this is in a Rahu cycle, right? He was, he was literally doing that. He was having sex with as many porn stars as he could, and, and Playboy bunnies, and everything, right, that he's doing. So he was, you know, caught up in a lot of stuff. And also there's that lust for power. There's that lust for immortality. Remember the, the serpent, the demon, is trying to get that taste of immortality. He just gets that just little bitty taste, and then gets cut in half. He's immortal now, but he's, he's now in two pieces. Um, so, so he was, you know, going crazy for 18 years and now he gets to deal with all of the, all the results of that. And he's in a Jupiter cycle now. Um, and I don't know, is he having any legal issues? I mean, he's in a Jupiter cycle. Maybe some legal issues might happen for him here. Um, we can talk more about that, but obviously we're going to run, run out of time at some point here. So, uh, that was something I definitely want to show you guys too. Let me just look over my notes real quick and just see if there's anything else really interesting that we can drop here. So Sade Sati, Sade Sati means seven and a half. Um, so in, in Vedic astrology, um, you know, like we have the Saturn return in the West, right? That's like the big, the big thing. Oh, it's your Saturn return. And it, it is a big deal. Uh, in Vedic astrology, it's the Sade Sati. Seven and a half years when Saturn transits the moon or the sign before the moon or the sign after the moon. So it's the, when it reaches the sign before the sidereal moon and then the sidereal moon sign. And the sign after the sidereal moon, that's when Saturn brings a lot of lot of lessons to people and teaches them a lot about themselves. Um, and it's interesting to be aware of that because it's a different cultural thing, right? 
that they don't have a big awareness of the Saturn return, for example, in Indian astrology. But Sade Sati, oh yeah, you know, and it's true. It's surprisingly true. People get through the seven and a half years of Sade Sati and things really lighten up in their lives. And they go through those seven and a half years and they, they get tested a lot and they get challenged by, you know, by Saturn a lot. Um, what else do we have here that I haven't talked about? <laughs> I have touched on quite a few things, which is good. Let me just give you guys the other Digbala positions. So um, remember I said that uh, Jupiter and Mercury have Digbala uh, in the east, right, when they're rising. So uh, if you have Mercury rising, Jupiter rising, they have Digbala. You can do what Mercury wants to do, and they can help the Ascendant do what it wants to do. I actually think of um, George W. Bush, um, who had Mercury in the first house. And think about the way that guy got through life, right? He was basically just, he could just schmooze anybody, right? He could talk to anybody and he was a, he was a likable guy. So that's that's how he got around in life, just Mercury. Just boom, I'm George Bush, blah, 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 right? <laughs> that's, that's his thing, man, pretty simple. All right, so um, think about the other ones here. Let's go, we've got Moon and Sun, we've got Venus, Saturn, uh, what are we leaving out? Mars. But who do you think finds directional strength on the IC? Moon and Venus. So when Moon and Venus are on the IC, they have Digbala, directional strength in Vedic astrology. There are many Balas. There are many strengths in Vedic astrology. This is just one of them. It's one of the ones I just kind of use more in my practice, I guess. And it works with locational astrology well, too. Um, so uh, Moon and Venus, when they're on the IC, the IC can do what it wants to do. They can do what they want to do. There's, a, there's like a synergy there. The Midheaven is Sun and Mars, right? Makes sense. When you see the sun and Mars uh, near the midheaven, they can do what they want to do for the midheaven. The midheaven can kind of do for them. You know, they, they kind of work together. Um, we have Saturn, who actually is uh, has Digbala on the descendant, which also tells you that um, Saturn doesn't have Digbala on the ascendant, right? It's on the descendant. Uh, li likewise, Jupiter and Mercury don't have Digbala when they're setting. So one of the things that, that this helped me like kind of appreciate about myself as an astrologer and understand about myself. So I'll show you my tropical chart real quick. So I have um, I have Jupiter over here in the sixth house, conjunct Chiron and Aries. And so I don't have Digbala with Jupiter. And over the course of my career as an astrologer, I haven't done a lot of teaching. I've definitely given lectures all over the place and I've talked and done, you know, classes, but that's not been like my main, main thing, right? Whereas what I really do a lot is I really do a lot of work with clients in the sixth house. I'm really in the trenches, helping people one at a time. I have a very specialized knowledge with locational astrology. That's my kind of Jupiter. And when I do work with teachers, a lot of times, like when I, I put on a conference, right? I put on two conferences in, in Sedona and um, I networked with all the teachers. So that's kind of my seventh house relationship to Jupiter. Here, here's 30 great astrologers. Let's put on a conference together. You know, it wasn't so much, you know, just come listen to Moses for, you know, the whole weekend. So that was a really, really interesting piece to me to see the difference between like me versus someone like Kelly, right? And Kelly, all kinds of Jupiter rising, right? He's just real supernatural teacher like that. Whereas like I kind of have a little more specialized knowledge. So I like to teach sometimes because I have things I can definitely share with people, but it's not necessarily my whole gig and it's different, right? So when you see the planets in those positions, generally they can do what they want to do more so. And generally those angles in a lot of, in a lot of ways can do more of what they want to do too. Saturn with the seventh is a tricky one. Obviously Saturn in the seventh is not always great for a relationship. And Saturn in the sixth, I think, can also be very much not always great for a relationship either, which is also near the descendant. I guess that's another story for another time. Um, I will say um, a couple other things that were on my notes I didn't get to that I had stars next to. We also have things like a um, Navamsha chart or divisional charts, Varga charts in Vedic astrology. That is a whole other thing. And it's actually pretty neat. Like here's Kelly's chart again. This is pretty interesting. Look at Kelly's, uh, this chart here, Navamsha chart. He's Aquarius rising with Mercury and Aquarius. The Navamsha chart is sometimes given as a house of Dharma or a, a chart for spouse. I'll, I'll explain this in a sec. Um, a lot of people say it's kind of the chart of like the second half of your life. It's almost like the soul, what you're growing into. Some people project maybe it's even the future life because of that. Um, so you have divisional charts where you sort of take all the planets and you slice everything up and rearrange everything a certain way based on a certain logic and you put everything in a new place. And Vedic astrology has a whole lot of this. It's cool. Uh, you can get into it. Um, but it's a neat thing. And the ninth, the, the D9, the Navamsha, the ninth harmonic 
is often about the spouse and, and marriage as well. Uh, the D10 is often given, um, used a lot because it's a lot about career. So you, you have a chart that's more specific to your career, and that's a whole thing. That's a whole thing. The, var the Varga charts are a whole thing. Um, I will say, by the way, in, in one thing I like a lot better about Tropical personally, I think it works better for just straight synastry and relationship compatibility. Um, because the sidereal zodiac is more objective and less psychological, though not unpsychological, but again, less psychological compared to tropical. I just don't think it works as well if you're just doing basic synastry. And I can think of a real simple anecdotal personal example, but so I have Scorpio rising. Okay. I dated a girl once who was born the same exact day as me. <laughs> she was Libra rising in tropical. And we had the, the dysfunction a Scorpio and a Libra rising should have together. Okay. However, in Vedic astrology, we had the same rising sign. We were both Libra. Didn't really seem to help us. My wife, meanwhile, is a Virgo rising in uh, tropical. So Scorpio and Virgo, basically those are compatible. Um, and we get along, we get along well. You know, our personalities mesh pretty, pretty darn well. Um, in sidereal, I'm a Libra rising and she's a Virgo rising. We don't have those kind of problems. So anyway, again, very anecdotal example there. But I just think that because tropical has that... Um, that very psychological dimension to it. When you when you look at how people mesh in relationship and whether or not their personalities are kind of fundamentally um, compatible or not, tropical is just a better one to look at for that. So um, that's not to say that Vedic astrology doesn't have techniques for a relationship. I find I don't really need to look at them just because I, I think I can do some stuff with tropical with that. Um, but I thought some some of you guys might find that uh, might find that piece interesting. Um, there's, there's a whole lot we could talk about. Obviously, we've been here for two hours now, and I've kind of hit all the stars on my notes. So I'm going to just uh, check in with Adam and then maybe start answering questions, or if we need to log off, we'll log off. So um, how does Pluto in setting do, like in Virgo? It's, um, they don't really use Pluto in traditional Vedic astrology. Now, the Neo-Vedic astrologers will use Pluto, but not the classical ones. So, so that is kind of outside the scope of Vedic astrology. So I'm going to skip that question. I'm wondering what the dashes are based on how they're calculated. So it's based on which nakshatra your moon is in, and each nakshatra is ruled by a planet. So for example, my moon is in a uh, nakshatra ruled by Rahu. So I was born into a Rahu cycle. If you're born into a cycle, or, or if your moon nakshatra is, uh, maybe it's um, Punar Vasu and it's ruled by Jupiter, then you're gonna be born in a Jupiter cycle. But it's proportional. So if you're at the very end of it, you could just have like a year of Jupiter before you go into Saturn. Or if you're born at the beginning of it, you'll have like maybe 16 years of Jupiter. Um, so that's basically how that works. And I think it's pretty neat how that works out. You can even use them in, um, in rectification. I had a client recently, she was adopted. I felt really, really good about the rectification work I did on her chart. And the dashas turned out to be really useful because she had the six year period in her son. When I, after, after I'd rectified the chart, it all lined up perfect. Uh, a six-year sun period where she married a second guy and then that ended and now she's in her moon cycle and it's divorced and it's bad because her moon is in Scorpio in the sixth house with Saturn. She's not in a great cycle right now for that. She's having a you know, hard time dealing with this divorce and all this stuff. So, And then she had 20 years before that of Venus. She's got Venus in Libra in, in the fifth house with Rahu. This creates a powerful Venus-Rahu conjunction. She made a lot of money in those years um, working as actually a lobbyist um, in Alaska for fisheries. And um, so, you know, it lined up with when she made money, lined up with when she met her second husband. Now it's lining up with this whole divorce process. So you can even use these in rectification because the cycles are that powerful. And you can just kind of look at the life and kind of figure, oh, well, it looks like you went through 10 years of your moon cycle, you know, over those 10 years when you maybe had all your kids or something like that. So um, I think that's a really cool thing to look at. Let's see, wondering, well, we got that one already. Uh, cool. So my sidereal and tropical moon rulers the same. Okay. So can I use the dashas with my tropical chart? Sorry, I must be having a Virgo overload today, Karen. Um, no, don't use the tropical chart with the dashas. That's my advice. Some people do it. I would advise against it. Um, <laughs> all right. I'm going to skip the one about Pluto again. Um, there's another one again. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> um, da, 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 where we go? Here we go. Okay, so I think we got through those questions, and uh, I'm open again. If you have any questions, we are at about two hours, so you guys might be starting to, you know, lose a little interest perhaps, um, but I'm happy to talk. You know, people have questions, so um, Adam is here as well. Can we, can, everybody, we, can you hear me? 
Yeah. OK, great. I'm just going to share. Um, I'm going to switch back over and remind everybody how to make a donation really quick. OK. <clears throat> Let's see here. So um, yeah, we are at 9 o'clock. And um, I see you know people dropping off a bit. So I just want to make sure I give a plug here. If you haven't yet made a donation for um, the talk this evening, uh, the link is in the box now. You can see the screen up here in a Donate button. Um, 15 to 25 is the suggested for our talk tonight. And if you can do more, please do. We've had some um, really nice, generous donations uh, come in during the talk tonight. So thank you guys for those who've already uh, thrown into the virtual hat. Yeah. And um, yeah, this has been um, really, really fascinating, Moses. I've just learned a whole lot. So, and I've been like, you know, I'm sure like a lot of people, I've been like looking at my periods here while you're talking, <laughs> like checking it all out and everything. Right. So, yeah, it's really cool. And um, I'm, I'm definitely feeling more motivated now to, I have like sitting on my shelf, I have um, Light on Life. Is that mm. what you were talking about? Yeah. I've got yeah, that, that sitting great. on my shelf. And I think I also have one called the Graha Sutras. Uh, by Ernst Wilhelm. Yeah. Looks like I, I, that. Yes, yes, yes. Perfect. Yeah, I've got that too. So I have a few that I've like, you know, I've collected over time. I've been meaning to look at them. And now I'm like really motivated to actually sit down and, you know, crack them open. Let me tell you actually a, a book I wanted to recommend. Um, this one's called Astro Logos by James Braha. Um, I often recommend this as a starter book because it's kind of like kind of like autobiography of a yogi, but it's more like autobiography of a Western astrologer who turned into a Vedic astrologer. And it's really kind of reproachable in that way. It's his story of him getting into Western and how he got into Vedic and learning some Vedic too. So he dropped some interesting like knowledge of Vedic in here as well. I think that's one of the more approachable um, things you can learn. And and I, I do think Linda Johnson, as I drop a stack of books, I do think Linda Johnson is really great though. And again, that one's there too. So highly recommend checking her out. She is still around. I checked with... Um, Dennis Harness earlier today, and he said she's still around and might be at the conference for Vedic Astrology, which uh, I actually wanted to mention for him real quick is, um, what is it, Sedona, SedonaVedicAstrology.com. Uh, Dennis is putting on these conferences. There's one coming up in November, December. I hope to be there, and um, it's a good way to do that in Sedona, not too far from where I live, but uh, yeah, there's, uh, there's some great, great people out there. Sorry to interrupt. Very cool. Um, no, that's that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. So if people wanted to um, book a reading with you, some relocational mm -hmm. astrology, or have you help them maybe take a look at their periods or sure. um, or what have you, um, let's let me I'm going to put your website in, but tell tell everybody the easiest way to do that. Yeah, um, the website is all spelled out astrology for the soul dot com. And uh, you can definitely read up on stuff there. Contact me. Here's my phone number, my email. Um, and happy to talk to you guys about that. I do with my work. It is very much focused on uh, on locational astrology, but I do general readings as well. And then I do kind of these like combo readings that are, you know, the Vedic and the Western and location and kind of whatever someone wants to talk about. So I do kind of general readings and then I do just location readings. It's kind of like the two things that I do. But um, that's yeah, that's really what I what I enjoy doing. I like just love helping people try to figure these things out. And in Vedic astrology, I want to be clear, too, that there are lots of Vedic dasha cycles that people study. But the one we're talking about here is the most popular one and very arguably the most powerful one. So even if that's all you look at, it's a lot to add to what you do. And I think eventually it's a it's a good thing to have some knowledge of for sure. I I don't know how I would do what I do now without it. You know, it's so great to have that knowledge. But, you know, it's not, you have to take time to study this stuff too. So it's not like you can just pick it up and, and, and it's easy. You got to put the work in to study it. But hopefully with a good teacher, you can kind of get there faster. Um, that is something I would like to teach uh, people how to do because I've come from that angle of being a Western astrologer and then learning how to do the Vedic stuff so that it's like still my second language, but it's something that I'm proficient in, you know. Um, so yeah, definitely get in touch if you're interested in trying to learn that stuff as well. But I, I would just encourage you too. you know, it's, if you're, if you're like me, this eternal astrology student, and you just love studying this stuff, you know, then, Hey, guess what? <laughs> You've got a whole new field you can study. So you're never going to run out of stuff to study in astrology, luckily. 
And uh, it can be a pretty cool, pretty cool journey to uh, to discover things and see things in a different light. That really one of the nice things about it is you don't have to relearn everything. Like so much of what you already know, you can already apply. The houses aren't that different. You know, the planets aren't that different. The signs aren't that different. Some of the aspects aren't that different. So you already have such a huge head start on studying Vedic astrology if you already know Western. Um, that's really an advantage. And someone who has like a, an orientation toward more classical or ancient forms of astrology is also going to be one step ahead because Vedic astrology has a little more of that kind of predictive concrete sort of nature to it. And so you might like that too. For me, Vedic astrology made me a much better like predictive astrologer, just generally much better to just obsessing, uh, uh, sorry, assessing things like uh, realistically um, because it's so much more like the, the ancient Western styles of astrology. So it's, it's more akin to the classical Western stuff than the modern stuff. And I think that that makes it a really nice combination too. Brilliant. And, and um, Moses, if people want to check out the upcoming class that you are um, offering and the different potential options for that, where on your website would they find that? There is a link up there that says classes. Um, so you can actually go on there and you can sign up for it right now. I actually have it set up as a donation. So it's actually, um, I'm trying something, this is an experiment. So the idea is to do a donation basis for a 12 week class, 25 bucks to 500 bucks, you know, pay what you can kind of thing, see if it works. I don't know yet if it's going to work. I hope it does. Um, I think it'd be a great class. Uh, but if not, I'll just go back to working with clients every day. <laughs> it's what I usually do anyway. So, um, but yeah, I'm trying to put myself out there a little more as a teacher right now, but you know, we'll see what the universe wants me to do. So here it is. You can see next online class starts soon, holistic astrology, but open to this being Vedic for Western. Um, so definitely check this out, everyone. Um, I think it would be if you if you you know if this like really caught your attention tonight and you're just geeking out about astrology and trying to look for you know more information a good teacher a good place a good community um, you know obviously my I'm biased because I like I feel like um, you know Moses already feels like a sort of Cancerian brother to me but I feel like you know. Y People who are interested in creating astrological community, um, in my experience, ho often hold the best classes because they are um, often. I think there's a an ability to create a feeling of at homeness in the classroom. This is the mm -hmm. cancer energy that I'm thinking of that we share here, Moses. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. you know, and so that's why I would I would say really um, you know check this out if you're looking for more study and this like spoke to you tonight. So. Yeah. Um, Thank so you. that's what, yeah, you bet. Um, we'd like to have you back too. Let's, let's do this again. Awesome. Um, awesome. So yeah. just as a reminder for everybody, um, we are going to, we're going to kind of close things down now, but um, uh, remember that we're redoing Gemini Brett's talk next week on Wednesday night, because there we had a uh, meltdown of the audio video afterwards. So um, uh He's a magical Gemini creature, so he brought some Hermes, <laughs> he brought some Hermes <laughs> magic, and then with Mercury retrograde, we lost the audio. So mm. we're gonna do it again next Wednesday. So if you want to come out to that, feel free. Um, if you want to donate for Kelly's talk or Gemini Brett's talk, you can also pitch in a little extra tonight and get those audio videos. If you want a copy of this tonight, because you, you know, at some point you had a kid that needed something or, you, you know, whatever came and you missed a part of it and you want to read, listen back to something that you missed or you want to listen to it again because it was so good, um, then just email me at nightlightastrology at gmail.com and I'll send you guys a copy of the talk. Um, and uh, yeah, and um, so make sure you also um, check out Moses website. If you haven't donated already, remember to do that at my website as well. So Moses, thanks for being here tonight. This was really fun. Thank you. Thank you. Real quick. Uh, if you do go to my site, I have a few things on there, like an article I wrote on locational astrology that was published in uh, uh, astrology, the next generation, which was a book that came out like five years ago. Um, so that's a pretty like weighty article. And I'm also doing my um, interpretations of the Tao Te Ching right now. If you're into that, like I am, um, that's there. I also wrote a poem about Kelly Lee Phipps, if you haven't read it. And I have an old article on um, the spiritual dimension of Taurus that was in the Mountain Astrologer in like 2002, I think, or 2001. Um, that's on there as well. And so anyway, the website's growing. I've got a blog now on locational astrology. 
I do stuff with flower essences as well. I do a lot of work with flower essences. So yeah, I'd be happy to talk to you guys about any of that. Feel free to call me, email me. And uh, um, Adam, really incredible to be here. Such a great thing. I'm so glad you're doing what you're doing. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. And just by the way, I put your Facebook page in there. Can people find oh, yeah. regular updates and things like that on Facebook? Yeah, yeah. I tend to do, yeah, kind of my, like, maybe like a few times a week, I talk about the astrological weather. Um, and that's uh, always on that Facebook page. So that's a good one for that, too, if you're into keeping up with that business. Very cool. All right. Awesome. Well, I hope to have you back and hopefully get to meet you in person at one of these conferences at some point. Absolutely. All right. Take care, everyone. <laughs> everyone have a very good night. And hopefully we'll see some of you next week uh, with Gemini Brett's talk. Take care, everyone. Right. Good night. Thanks, everyone.